So please, everyone at the Daytona Beach Comic Con, welcome Bill Black. Thank you. I want to introduce Craig Zablo. Uh, Craig is going to be uh, the devil's advocate here and ask me questions about uh, what, what our topic is. Uh, I've known Craig since 78 when I relocated back to Central Florida. He is best friends with John Beatty, who you may have heard of. Have you heard of John Beatty? <laughs> That's embarrassing. Uh, big time baby. He's a star anchor um, for Marvel, uh, among other companies. Uh, okay, um, I'm. I've been in the business. We said 45 years on the thing, but it's longer than that. It'll be 50 years later this year, I think. Well, next year, next year will be 50 years. Okay, Craig. <laughs> Well, Bill Black, if you don't know, uh, is really a renaissance guy. He's done it all. He started off in early days of fandom, uh, was a freelance artist, uh, worked for Marvel, worked for Warren, Charlton, uh, and then he decided he wanted to publish his own comics, and he was one of the first, were you not the first? One of the first one of the, the first first independent five. publishers. And, uh, and the only one that's still in business. Today. And so he decided, you know, he decided to go in that, uh, in that, in that direction. But we want to make this interactive. We'll, I'll ask Bill some questions first, and then we'll open it up to you guys because you may have different questions about it, aspects of his career. But in talking to Bill, you really grew up in the time that seemed to me to be the most right because moving in your, your passions. You guys, one of the things about Bill is he's so passionate uh, about different things, movies, comics. But that's what this guy was talking about in the last panel. Absolutely. Uh, but your early days of fandom, uh, can you tell us a little bit about days before there was internet, before... Oh, internet. yeah. Um, I collected comic books since I was six years old. And uh, that was in Pennsylvania, and then we moved down to Florida in 51. I'm old. And uh, there was not the excitement about comic books here that there was in uh, Pennsylvania, where everybody, every household had comic books. Um, so, I thought I knew about comics, and I always wanted to draw comics, and I went to school at Florida State, and I sent submissions into uh, Stan Lee and to uh, Archie and Warren Publications, and um, I got a nice response from fabulous Flo Steinberg, and <laughs> uh, I dealt with uh, the, the people there who uh, actually gave me my first professional job. I was paid $25 to do a sample page for Marvel. This was about 1964, 1965. And luckily they rejected me and they did not hire me. Uh, that's lucky because um, if you're an artist, you have a very small universe. You're sitting at a drawing table eight or 10 hours a day and you don't interact with the world. Going to Florida State was one of the best experiences I ever had in my life, and I learned uh, how to cope with the world and to be independent. Um, after Florida State, while I was at Florida State, anytime I would do anything for any art class that looked like comic book art, of course, my professors hated that. And I, uh, I was a big fan of Vincent Price, and I made a point of every art class I was in, I would submit a, a drawing I did of Vincent Price, which also was not appreciated. <laughs> um, after I graduated in 66, I immediately was drafted and went into the Army in 67. Uh, and uh, I um, did samples. I, I worked as an illustrator in the Army, and I was allowed to come in after hours and key to the shop. And I had a drawing table. All my life, I've been blessed with what I call strange luck. And, Everywhere I go, things get lucky for me. If you've been in the Army or served in the service, you know you don't have access to what I had access to. It was really amazing. So at, while I was in the Army, I uh, did samples for Warren Publications, and they uh, did uh, their most famous book was Famous Monsters of Filmland. But they also did comic books, Creepy and Eerie, which were magazine comics, where they were trying to relive the comic books that were censored when the comics code came in. Uh, magazine format, you could get away with stuff you weren't under the uh, guidelines of the comics code authority. Uh, so long story short, when I got out of the Army, uh, I'd already made headway with um, 
Bill Parenti, who was the editor at Warren, and he hired me as a freelancer, and I, I did some work for Creepy and Eerie. So I actually was a professional comic book artist before I was a fan artist. And while I was in the Army, of course, all my life I bought Marvel comics since they started coming out. And in the back of the comics back in those days, they had all these little ads, and uh, people who did fanzines would put their little ads in there. And so I, I bought a book called the RBCC, the Rockets Blast Comic Collector, which is out of Miami. It was mostly an ad scene, and all the other publishers, um, these guys should have stayed to listen to this, uh, there were a group of people that I didn't know about that did their own amateur comic books, and they were called fanzines. So I bought uh, maybe half a dozen of these that um, had good looking ads. Some of the ads were really horrible, but the ones that were the best looking I, I bought. And that was my entry in 1969 uh, into comic fandom. And uh, at that time, there were a lot of people who would publish a book, like say Drew, put, he'd put out uh, WrestleMan or something like something that he liked, okay? And, uh, but most of the comics, uh, fanzines dealt with paying homage to Marvel and DC characters. There really weren't any independents at all in those days. So uh, I thought that rather than working for Marvel or DC where I had to draw Spider-Man or whatever, if you were lucky, it terrified me that I had to draw the New York City uh, <laughs> cityscape or all those webs. Uh, so uh, I thought it was a great idea. If you did your own fancy, you could publish your own work, you could do your own characters. Much as I loved Captain America and um, Batman and all that, I felt as an artist I wanted to have my own characters, and that was the direction I took. And I started Paragon Publications, and um, uh, this is the cover to the fourth issue of Paragon Illustrated. When it was originally published, it was uh, not in full color. It had color, but it wasn't full color. I don't know if you recognize the artwork or if you've even heard of this guy, but at the time, uh, this was one of the hottest guys in the industry. His name is Jim Steranko. Anybody hear Jim Steranko? No? <laughs> no <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> we are getting old. <laughs> He's a uh, uh, hero of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, he was the main guy. That, Kirby did the first couple issues, then Steranko took over it. And his, uh, his artwork uh, set new standards for the industry. And I was, I met Jim at a convention in uh, New York and we became friends and he did this piece of art. And uh, um, J. David Spurlock, who was a publisher, and I guess he handles a lot of strength and stuff, said to me at a convention, he said, have you ever thought about how many people have inked Jim Strank up? And I had never thought about that before, but there's probably only six human beings on the surface of the planet that have inked Jim Strank up, so I got lucky. Uh, I think that, and uh, so I, I did Paragon Publications, which uh, most fanzine publishers, they did their own title, but I wanted to be like a real comic book company, so I have a series of titles, and between 1970 and 82, I, I did uh, a line of books for Paragon Publications. Uh, this got the attention of Roy Thomas, who was editor at the time of editor-in-chief of, of Marvel at the time. Uh, he started off as a fanboy uh, way before me and uh, he wrote me a letter saying that uh, then I think it was time I did some inking work for Marvel Comics. So that's how I got into Marvel. I don't know that they had bucket lists back then that if they did that would have been one thing I could check off that I, I did some work for Marvel although it wasn't a particularly exciting experience. Uh, and it certainly wasn't a <laughs> <laughs> experience then. Uh, so uh, while I was, one of the books I did for Roy was uh, a book called uh, What If the Avengers Were, Was Formed in the 1950s. Well, I grew up in the 1950s, so I really loved doing that book. And I, I got to draw characters that I read about back in the 50s. And there were several female characters in the story as support, and I wrote to Roy, I said, wouldn't it be great if uh, Marvel did a book where they made a team of all the female characters? That's never been done before. Don't you think that would be, you know, a, a good idea? And he wrote me back and said, if 
female characters just don't sell. So he poo-pooed the idea. So I thought it was a good idea. And so I, in my own Paragon publications, I created the first uh, all-female super team called the Fem Force. We didn't bring one of those. We did not. No. Uh, okay, this is some art from some of the book. Okay, here's a cover. But uh, I think uh, Eric Coyle drew that. Uh, so, independent comics started in 1981 or 82. A guy named David Scroggy out in California started. Um, Eclipse? No, no. Uh, Pacific. Pacific, Pacific, Pacific comics, comics, which I think historically is the first independent publisher. And he encouraged me uh, to do that, join in and become a. Uh, this was national distribution fancy. It was all done through the mail. Although our circulation on some of my Paracon books, I wish we had today. <laughs> uh, selling them by mail, I was able to sell 12, 14,000 copies, you know, in one at a time. And, um, I know at one point Wonder Woman didn't even have a circulation of 10,000. Uh, I, I think it's important to point out too, because the crowd is so young, that uh, there were no computers to do comics oh, no. on. Uh, so when you were doing a, a, a comic back then, the process was much more labor intensive. Yes. Um, I was working for a film production company at the time and uh, the corporate company that owned it decided that we would go out of business. So I became a comic book publisher two weeks after that. And uh, I got, I was having stuff printed at a local printer and he knew connections with a big web press printer up in Ocala. And so we uh, did our first AC Comics there. And as Craig was saying, all this stuff is now generated on a computer and it's, it's real easy. Back then everything had to be done by hand and all the color separations had to be done by hand. It was a very laborious process. Uh, so it, um, I created a lot of characters. I was an artist, a writer, an inker, a letterer, all that. Then we started the, the comics. I was also a colorist. But after the first month I realized there was so much labor involved in this I couldn't do it. So I, went, I sought other people uh, to uh, do the actual work. And I spent like the next 34 years not doing a whole lot of hard work. So before AC Comics, I was doing work like this. <laughs> and then during AC Comics, I was doing work like this. But only now that I'm, I, I turned AC Comics over to my associate editor in 2014, I now, I'm out from under the 30 day deadline, which is, I was at a point of, after 34 years reaching a nervous breakdown stage because you, you couldn't go anywhere to do anything. You had to do this constantly because you had to make that deadline every 30 days. If you didn't get your book out, you didn't get paid. If you didn't get paid, you couldn't make your mortgage, you couldn't pay your rent, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now I'm uh, blissfully retired. I'm still doing everything I did before. I don't have a deadline, which I enjoy, and I'm making a lot more money than I ever did when I was <laughs> AC Comics. So. You, you talked about being AC being one of the longest running comic companies. Uh, do you want to mention anything about the boom or bust periods that the comics have gone through? Oh, yeah. Um, because when the well, independence first started out, there was a, was a there big, was a boom, boom, big boom. boom. The circulation was, was pretty astronomical. Uh, that was almost the year 1983. By November, <laughs> everything was starting to tank in, in this first year. I mean, we were selling 30, 40,000 copies. You know, and that was just, I mean, who, who would have imagined that? Uh, but there was a real um, need for other product besides Marvel and DC. If you were into superheroes, you had Marvel, you had DC, that was it, there was nothing else. And most of the people that did independent comics, like John Beatty, um, all of us. Uh, see, this is a guy that, what I mentioned before, that no one had ever heard of. <laughs> He's called Big Time Beatty because he, he did The Punisher and he did Captain America and Secret he did Wars. Secret Wars and Batman. You know, I was like that. 17 and you were 35. 17 he was 35. <laughs> 
So John started with me back in the Paragon days, uh, and he, he contributed some work to Craig did too, the second issue of AmeriComics and AC Comics. Oh, but the boomer bust, okay. Um, yeah, throughout the industry, there, throughout the decades in the industry, there have been times when things have gone to the slumps and a lot of uh, companies have gone out of business. And uh, that killed essentially the first run of independent comics. What really killed independent comics was uh, Marvel and DC were sitting back saying, <laughs> Oh, okay, I think we can do this. So they did, and they did exclusives for the comic shops. And at that time, uh, uh, comic shops, I don't even think, had Marvel and DC Comics. That was the big deal. That's why they really in, uh, appreciated all of us independents coming in. Um, so I think that's what killed the independent market was Marvel and DC getting into it. And then everything went from color to black and white. So there was a black and white surge yeah. in the uh, early 90s after that, and that, that kind of petered out after a while. And uh, most of the companies that made a big splash, uh, Eclipse and uh, First First Comics, and First was very impressive. Uh, Neil Adams did a book for, for First. I, you guys Mike never Burrell. heard of him. Yeah. And, was uh, Malibu in the 90s too? Yeah, that was, that was a little later, but this, this first run of the really big guys. Uh, yeah, Chaykin did American Flag, yeah. and um, I supported all the eight, all the independent comics. I bought a copy of everything, but I was so busy I never had time to read them. <laughs> Around 1987, I picked up a, an American Flag, which had this gorgeous artwork by Howard Chaykin, and a lettering by Ken Ruziak, is that mm -hmm. how you pronounce it? It was really, you, it, you wouldn't think of this, but you would even buy this book just because the lettering was so great. I mean, that's a... Uh, but you might agree with me on that since you're a design guy. So anyways, I read this American flag and hated it. By this time, I bought 14 issues of it. <laughs> and it was in 1987 that I decided I was going to go cold turkey and I stopped buying comic books. And uh, just kept doing my own thing, uh, which I have really enjoyed. But I, I uh, created a whole line of characters that debuted in 1983 that are still going today. So. I, I didn't know what to do for the second month in 1983. Now it's, it's still going. I mean, uh, we were startled when we hit the 20th issue of Film Force, and now it's at 182. 180, yeah, next issue will be 182. So, uh, you know, you talked about John. Over the course of the years, you worked with not only some. You brought in some of the legends to yeah. work with you. Yeah. Uh, if you want to talk about any of those, and then we can talk about some of the people who got their start with you. Um, Dick Ayers, I don't know if you know who Dick Ayers is, but in the 50s and 60s, he was a, a, a big force in comics, both as an artist and as a, a, an inker. Uh, he's mostly known for working with Stan Lee and Jack Kirby on the Marvel comics in the 60s. The Monster Things and the Fantastic Four, uh, most all those books were written by Dick Ayers. Uh, when I was a little boy, he did a book called The Ghost Rider, so he was one of my heroes. The Ghost Rider was just tremendous. Uh, uh, not the motorcycle guy with his head on the fire. Supernatural Western. This was a Western guy. He wasn't yeah, really supernatural, yeah. but they, he faked everybody into thinking he <laughs> was a real ghost. So um, I had started reprinting old comic books around 89, and uh, I reprinted some of those books. I, I got up with a publisher who published the original Ghost Rider. It was Magazine Enterprises. His name was Vin Sullivan. If you don't know the name Vin Sullivan, he was a guy that started out at DC and he was a guy that started Superman. So he was an important person in uh, the overall history of comics. Uh, and Vin granted me permission to reprint everything that he had done for uh, uh, magazine enterprises. So I was reprinting some stuff and some of Dick's work and Dick got mad at me because he wasn't getting paid the residuals for the stuff I was reprinting not realizing how little money these things were making, but I, I, I paid him some had residuals and said, hey, would you like to do some new work for me? And, and he worked on film for us and, gosh, almost everything we did. Uh, I, I, by this time, Marvel had stolen the name Ghost Rider, so we couldn't use the name Ghost Rider, but I, I, I had the character, the Western character, and I call him the Haunted Horseman. So one of my thrills was to get Dick Ayers to do another Haunted Horseman story that I wrote. And 
um, I think he penciled and inked it. And he, he was one of the few people in the business who penciled and inked and lettered his own work. And um, I don't even know how you do that. I mean, he and Jack Kirby were mutants. How do you get to turn out that much work? Usually it takes a day to pencil a page and another day to ink a page, and then they send it off to a letter. <clears throat> so he was a speed name, but Steranko did a cover for me back in the fanzine days. Um, Pat Broderick uh, did several covers uh, for the AC line. Um, Paul Galassi. Paul Galassi. Uh, I have a big poster that uh, we did. It. We did a, a pair of a book called Star Films, and Paul did this fabulous drawing. Uh, we made a poster of it after I started AC Comics, and it's available in the room in there. George Perry uh, did a cover for. Oh yeah, that's a good story. Okay, <laughs> this cover I and the strength it did. Uh, when when I started AC Comics, it was me. We were doing two or three comics a month, and it was me. I didn't have <laughs> it. fabulous flow. I didn't have an associate editor. I didn't have anybody else. I was doing everything. So I was scrambling to get material, and I put out an advertising thing, no internet, just to, we had to mail this out. Uh, we would put advertising inserts in uh, with a diamond solicitation. Uh, this goes out to the individual stores. So I made this little pamphlet together, and I had this drawing, the strength of did for the first issue of Americomics. Well, I didn't have time to say, Jim, hey. I'm going to do this, is it okay with you, or, or can I pay you to do this? I didn't have time to do that. I would have done it before the book was published, but at this stage of the game, I hadn't done that. Well, he got really pissed off about that and got mad and uh, refused to allow me to use the cover. Uh, so uh, we were getting towards that deadline that the printers like said, you've got to get those books out every month. So John and Craig were at a convention, I guess, in New York. No, no, we were in Tallahassee. Were we in Tallahassee? Where were we, John? When we met? Oh, Gainesville. 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 God, was that close? Yeah, yeah. it was close. Well, I didn't know. Anyways, I get a phone call. Craig's on the phone. He says, hey, I got George Paris here to talk to. He said, George Paris? Who the hell's here? Oh, George Payraise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he puts me on with George Perez. And uh, George was kind enough to do a cover for the first issue of Americomics that we did through AC Comics of the same character, the shade, and I, I guess I already directed it over the phone. I told George what I would like him to do. I wish I had it here. Uh, it was a really spectacular piece that he did, and uh, I think I came out ahead of the game because at that time, George was probably number yeah. one most popular artist in comics at the time, and Stranko kind of dropped out of comics in 72. So this was 10 years later, and uh, so I think I did better with the, the press cover. It was one of the best selling books we did. Uh, who else did I hear? Uh, oh, well, you, you you published John Byrne, Marshall Rogers, oh, and your portfolio. Stuff. Yeah, 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 stuff. Stuff. Uh, yeah. What about some of the artists that weren't known and got their start with you, like John and Jerry Ordway, really wasn't yeah, a professional? Uh, um, Willie Piper. Willie Piper. Yeah. Um, um, Jerry Ordway is just a tremendous artist, and uh, he did a lot of fan work. He started out in fan, fandom. And I guess he came in through you guys, right? That's mm -hmm. how I got up. Yeah, I was pals with him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Still am, but I mean. Er er Eric uh, Larson, did Eric he? Larson, yeah. Eric Larson. Okay, Eric from Larson. The Savage, uh, Dragon. I, I published his first work in a real comic book. He had done some fanzine stuff. And, uh, Eric Larson did uh, um, Scarlet Scorpion and Night Vale and uh, Phase One Phasers. Uh, he was such an uh, astonishingly fast artist. Um, back in those days, you had to mail the artwork out to people. If you, if you had an anchor out of town inking it, you had to physically go to FedEx and ship the stuff out. Well, I got a package back from Eric like um, a week after I sent it to him. I thought, what the hell did it get returned in the mail? I was going to screw up our deadline. He'd done the whole thing, finished it you know, that fast. It was just another mutant. He must do five pages yep. a day or something. It's just astonishing. Well, he got his start with AC Comics and then went on to bigger and better things. Uh, another thing, uh, I was doing some work for Charlton in the early 80s before AC, and uh, I knew the associate editor there, Bill, Fe Bill Pearson, who also was a fan favorite guy. Uh, they had started a book at Charlton called Charlton Bullseye, where amateur guys could create their own characters and get it published through this bullseye. It's like 
DC showcase. So uh, Bill called me up. Uh, we were talking to him on the phone with Dan, and he said that they were going to have to cancel the bullseye, and he was heart sick about it because he had all this material that people had um, given him for publication. He's going to have to return it to all the artists. And he said he's out actively looking for a publisher who can use this. And I said, well, coincidentally, I just started this new company, AC Comics. And he said, no, no. He knew what the about the paragraphs. He said, this has to be in color. And I said, it's a color company. I can do it in color. So through Bill Pearson, I got the rights from Charlton to publish all the Charlton superheroes. At that time, it was Blue Beetle, Captain Atom, The Question, Nightshade. There was another one. Uh -oh. I know the one with the cross, the, the crawl, skull and crossbones. Uh, no, he's delusional. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to me. Anyways, um, so I got suddenly this big batch of artwork that was going to go into the bullseye that needed a home. And so, uh, what, the third issue of uh, American Comics was Blue Beetle and so on and so forth. We even published an Atomic Mouse because that was a uh, Charlton character. And um, in that crowd was. Um, I got um, Paul Ryan. Anybody remember Paul Ryan? He just passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. Uh, his first work was published through AC Comics, and he went on to become a very well known, a very popular artist, and a, a terrific guy. All these guys are nice guys. Uh, Dan Panosian. Dan Panosian and um, Tom Sanders. Lyle. Tom Lyle. Jimmy Sanders. Jimmy Sanders. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> And he passed Andy away Smith, just before yeah, Andy, yeah. Thanksgiving died. of last year. Yeah, Jimmy Sanders. If you don't know, um, he was a he was like fourteen or something when he started with me. Maybe fifteen, something. Probably like that. fifteen. Yeah, uh, very talented, and he went had a large career at um, Marvel as an anchor in Spider Man and Hulk and Oh, uh, McFarlane. Yeah, uh, he, <coughs> he he taught McFarlane on the Hulk uh, at, uh, at Marvel. Um, Ralph Cabrera, I didn't know, but he went on and did a lot of yes, work for Marvel yep. after AC yep. Comics. I didn't even know that. Um, June Brigman, who else? Yes. And Roy, Roy Richardson. Roy, Roy Richardson. Yeah, you, you probably don't know these people because they aren't around anymore, or they are. Or they, they are. Well, are they? they're around, but they're not active like me. You know, they're not on the monthly book or doing. Yeah, you're on a monthly book. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I, I don't Mark, think I Mark, can get back on a monthly book. Mark Probst and John Dell. John Dell's yep. a great guy. We have a lot of fun with him still. He's on Facebook a lot. Very talented guys. Uh, oh, a guy maybe you heard of? <laughs> but one of my... No, no, no. Go ahead. He's this little quiet guy. I always came with his mother. Um, what was his name? Greg. His name Horn. Greg, Greg, yeah, Greg Horn, that's his name, yeah. Anybody heard of Greg Horn? Yeah. Come on, you guys, you, oh, you guys are really young. Yeah. Now, he was like 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he, he, his mom came. His mother came to the Orlando Con. She had to, like, yeah. stay there with him because he was 14, and he was, like, really shy and embarrassed that his mom was, like, hanging out at the convention, and he was there. You know, she gave him space to hang out with us, but yeah. he was, like, really, you know. Yeah. He was, uh, he did a couple of issues of Fen Force and things for me and then uh, went on to be, uh, other than uh, Alex uh, Ross, probably the best cover painter, mm -hmm. uh, illustrator in comics today. I mean, he's just an, became an astonishing artist after he left me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of my favorite funny stories is uh, the story behind you doing well, let's talk about the poster for uh, that Paul did for, yeah. uh, and I'm I'm drawing a blank on the lady's name. Uh, uh, the character was Sybil called Danny. Black Blaze. No, oh, oh, Sybil Danny. Sybil oh, Danny. Okay. Yeah. We got to <laughs> tell the Sybil Danny. Story. Good thing one How many of you have heard of, of Sybil Danny? <laughs> yes, yes. Female no, actress. Gotta be, on the, <laughs> gotta be on the stars. You know, when I was up with Sybil, it was in eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, and it's what almost 40 years later, and the horrible thing is I look like this now, and she doesn't look any different. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so Danny was a, a B-movie actress, very well known, and uh, I, I got a call one night from her agent, 
And so I'm at home watching TV, and the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's her agent. And he's like, um, I'm the agent for Sybil Danny. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't really know who she was. Your call. And he's like, well, I, I want to get in touch with Bill Black. We've got an idea for a comic series. And, you know, I don't know who this guy is. And I was like, yeah, okay. I'll, um, and he's like, well, can you give me Bill's number? And I said, no, because I don't know who you are. And I said, but you give me your number and information, I'll let Bill know. And so a couple of days passed, and then I went, oh, Bill, by the way, you get this, you got a call from Sybil Dan, and he was like, what? <laughs> and so you can, you can take it from there. Yeah. That's when the nightmare started. <laughs> That's when the nightmare started. Yeah, um, the producer of the film was going to be Mike Frankovich Jr. Uh, Mike's father, I'm going to name names that you don't know. Mike Frankovich Sr. was a big time Hollywood producer who was married to a one time big time movie actress. And his father was Joe E. Brown, the famous movie comedian yeah. from the 30s. Okay, now Mike is just a couple of years older than me and we hit it off real well and we were going to do this thing. He was with Sybil Danning and uh, Sybil had done Battle Beyond the Stars for Roger Corman. And, um, she was, she's a beautiful blonde, very buxom, and uh, very popular with everybody, so we were, we were thrilled to do this. Uh, the things that sound real good also often turn into nightmares, and uh, Sybil was kind of feisty. I never got to meet her, but Steve Nance, who I was a buddy from when we lived in Tallahassee, and he's in comics too, or was, was out in California, and he got to meet her, and he got to get kissed by her, and he got to get her to sign all the books and stuff. And, uh, but um, that was the good part of, of Civil Danning, and the, the bad part was uh, um, we needed her to do this black, well, the character that uh, was created by Mike Frankovich was Black Diamond, it was a female spy, and Civil was going to be the spy, and she wore a black feather outfit, and Mike took a lot of pictures of her in the outfit, and we made posters of her, he did, and got a lot of publicity on it. Um, but when it came time to, to do the movie, um, Sybil up and takes a powder, ends up in uh, Italy um, doing movies. Uh, she was in the Lou Ferrigno Hercules movie, and she did another one called Seven Ladies or something over there. And while she was gone, we had to get someone else to play Black Diamond. We, we had done two or three issues of the comic book, and Paul Galassi is um, Craig pointed out was doing the covers to the whole Black Diamond series, and uh, he was drawing them to look like Sybil Danny. So when Sybil departed, Mike hired uh, Lois Hamilton, uh, who uh, was another blonde and even far more buxom <laughs> than Sybil. And I never met Sybil, but I met Lois, and I can attest to the fact she was far more buxom than anybody else I'd ever met in my life. Uh, we made these AC t-shirts and I set them on an extra small and uh, well that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so when Sybil came back from Italy, she just, this shit hit the fan boy. <laughs> she just really pissed off. I, I am Black Diamond. Nobody else is Black Diamond. And she called me up and she cussed me out one up and down and all around and everywhere. And uh, my wife almost left me because of Sybil Daddy. There's just so many things about that went wrong with Sybil Daddy. <laughs> so, I decided that I'd have to cancel the book. The book was doing pretty good, but uh, yeah, I just didn't want to get in the middle of a civil war between Mike Frankovich and Sybil Danning. I wouldn't mind getting in a war with Lois Hamilton. But, uh, so, is that what you want me to tell That's what I want you to tell you. That's exactly what I want Now, another interesting thing, this guy that called Greg, his name was Scott Basie, one of the most obnoxious people on the face of the earth. He, he must have gotten this started selling used cars, but he was that kind of a really aggressive guy. And he browbeat me into buying all these uh, photographs, which are color slides of Sybil Danning. A lot of them were nude slides of Sybil Danning, which I've kept to this day, and they've never seen the light of day. This is news to me. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah I, right uh, here. Uh, I, how easy it is not to scan a slide and, uh, and do anything you want to with it. So I get to do that, and I remind me to do that before I die. That doesn't sound <laughs> right at all. <laughs> that doesn't sound bad. I got lots of them. A Playboy spread, and that's why my oh, wife almost left me. Uh, and uh, she was very embarrassed that anybody would find out that I was friends with a woman who did a Playboy spread. I mean, how plans have changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Was this around the time too that you were weren't you contacted by ACDC and John was going to do something? No, <coughs> it wasn't. A, it was uh, cheap, cheap trick. Cheap trick. Yeah. Yeah. Cheap oh trip. yeah. Why I suffer from tinnitus today? <laughs> <laughs> we got up with cheap trick. Uh, I know you've heard of cheap trick. It's just the same guys not their head. Didn't they just get inducted into the Hall of Fame or something? I I'm not sure. Amazing because they're really horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had to buy some records and listen to them and all that. And we were prepared. Uh, they did a concert in Lakeland where they have all the rock and all the venues. So this was. It was a good night. It was. It was a good night. John and I went. It was Chuck Yates, who was my business manager, who I literally bodily threw out of the office in February of '84 because of unscrupulous dealings. Uh, he set this up and we got invited to the Cheap Trick concert and we got to be groupies. We got to be up Backstage. on the stage, on the stage on while the they were stage. performing behind those big amplifiers with some other little chickies who were real groupies who actually <laughs> knew who Cheap Trick was and all that. <laughs> so uh, John did a Cheap Trick drawing and I did a Cheap Trick drawing and we were pitching them on doing a Cheap Trick, that's hard to say, a Cheap Trick concert. Now this was put in to motion though by Chuck's wife. Yes, that's, that's true. Yeah. It's got the Japanese connection because they were very popular in Japan at that time. That's right. Like that's extremely right. off the ball. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, huge. Yeah. This is coming back to me now. So, his Chuck's wife, Cake, a beautiful right. Japanese lady. Um, knew some people who knew people. Knew some people. So, she went over to Japan to sell Japan on the idea that we were going to do a cheap trick comic. And also, that's why the company was called Amira Comics, which I hated. Because he said, we'll sell this in Japan and they love everything that's American. And so if we could work the name America into the title, so I said, America Comics. So we did that and I hated that. We changed it to AC later after I got rid of Chuck. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Keiko goes over there and she's <laughs> in Japan for a couple of weeks, wheeling and dealing all these people and stuff. And she comes back and, and she says, well, the crux of it was, uh, no. But, uh, <laughs> But they wanted to sell us a whole lot of leftover cheap trick stuff from, from their concerts over there. So they wanted to unload Jap Japanese stuff. Again, uh, the, the market went the opposite direction. Instead of being popular in Japan, of course, all the manga stuff came over here. And that's you know, just a complete reverse. But it was literally that whole project was just a matter of like two, like two months or so of bad timing, right? I mean. Yeah. At one time, they they were big over there, and then just bang, the bottom fell out. And well, they they had they had done so much over there. They were over there many times, I guess, and it just yeah, exposed. Yeah, it was overexposed, and they weren't going back. Uh, one of the things I remember, we were wearing the Americomics T-shirts, and uh, was it uh, Rick Nielsen, the mm -hmm. weirdo? Yeah, the guitar player. Yeah, he thought it was great. He was an insane man. He was great. We're standing there talking uh, backstage after the performance and we're you know, shooting the bulls at all of them. There's this dragonfly flying around <laughs> overhead. And he's standing there holding a drink. There. They were heavy drinkers. And he sees that dragonfly. There's a drink. <laughs> They're crazy. We, we had a lot of fun that night. But, yeah, it was uh, a good time. I'm deaf because of that. Because we were well, and, and the funny thing, too, is if you ever see a video of them or <laughs> you know who they are, Bunny Carlos, yeah. the drummer. <laughs> His thing is like he's a you know nine to five working guy. So he wears like a white shirt with the collar done, sleeves rolled up, and a tie, and smokes all the time while he's drumming. I mean, just smoke, smoke, smoke. And as soon as he goes backstage, they you remember he takes the oxygen. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, they have an oxygen tank back there for him because he's like you know he's dehydrated because he's working the drums and he's got a sweat going and he's smoking and he's just. You know, so he automatically, like, right to the oxygen. And, you know, it's like they had trash cans full of, you know, all the different kind of beers you would want or needed yeah, or yeah. whatever. You know, it's just the, the green room that they took their uh, concert breaks in. For. And Robin Zander, the beauty uh, yeah. handsome guy, he's about this tall, girls. <laughs> mm. Anyway, he had the, you know, his hair was. Rick, yeah, Rick, liked, yeah. the, Rick liked the t shirt and he wanted. T-shirt, so we all gave him a T-shirt so they could promote it. And he said, "You got any more?" I said, "Damn, Chuck goes out to the car, picks a whole box. We had a hundred of them, put it up, and cheap, cheap trick. They took all hundred." <laughs> so so many things went wrong with that. Project. And they took our pitch art too, right? Yeah. Well, no. 
I might still have that. You want to buy it back? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the price. <laughs> well, at the very start, well, I said, you know, I was talking about you being the, the Renaissance guy and your love of movies. Tomorrow we're going to talk about, we're going to do a panel on the movies that you've done. But I think, let's just touch on real quickly the comic characters the, of yours that you've turned into movie characters. Yeah. And we don't want to steal the thunder for tomorrow, but just yeah. a little bit of that. Um, like I said, I uh, created the first female group of uh, superheroes consisting of Night Vale, Ms. Victory, Stardust, Tara, Sin, and She-Cat. And uh, in the early 90s, San Diego, San Diego Con. Now you've heard of the San Diego Con. Come it's, on, it's called Comic Con. So, yeah. so. <laughs> Comic Con. Okay. Uh, one of our fans uh, created costumes for the whole team, and a couple more, Dragonfly, and a couple others. And um, they won best costume some category uh, at the San Diego that year. And I got up with the gal that played Nightville, uh, who had the costume. She had Nightville has two identities, Night Bell and the Blue Bulleteer. She has two costumes. One is far more revealing than the other. Her name was Mary Capps, and uh, she was coming to Orlando to do a, uh, a show uh, for David Sanford, who was, um, he had the license to do the Femme Force role-playing game, which was called Super Babes. She was coming for that, and so I thought, what, let's take advantage of that. She's got the costume, let's make a movie. So we made a movie and then John was in it. That's why he left it. He knew I was going to be there. So the, the first movie we did, this is before digital. I shot it on VHS and we, I didn't know what to do with it until uh, digital came out. Then we shot some new scenes and released it on uh, video. And that was the first movie I did. It was called Night Vale Witch War and it, it starred um, Mary Capps as Night Vale and the Blue Bulleteer. And uh, the, the Blue Bulleteer has a precarious top on her costume that is held up by a little string of pearls, like a pearl necklace kind of thing. It's based on the Golden Age Phantom Lady costume. And I wasn't there at the time this happened, but Mark Heike was the day that that string broke. So I, I missed out on that opportunity too. <laughs> Uh, but um, I think it was that costume that made that movie a success because it certainly wasn't anything well, about the quality of it. You, you, you approached it as low budget fun. You know, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And you've always. I, uh, I've always been involved in filmmaking all my life, and it's very expensive to make a movie, except nowadays you can make a movie for a couple hundred bucks. And that's what I've been doing up since that movie, um, mostly in the 2000s, I think. 2000, I may have released that in 2002, 2003, and from that on, point on, I've, I've made 30 movies and released. And I've had Night Vale, Blue Bulleteer, uh, Gargana, the, the giant woman, uh, Sin, um, um, I bought the rights to Nyoka, and we did several Nyoka movies. Nyoka was a Golden Age character, and she was also in the movie serials. She She's like serials a female. Jungle Girl. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who else? in the movies. Oh, Stormy Tempest, yeah, we did a bunch of Stormy Tempest movies, yeah. yeah. So that was fun, uh, you know, we've got to write the scripts and work with all these incredible women, um, young ladies, who wouldn't look twice at me, so it was terrific. I, I got to pay, you know, I should have bought that picture too. Huh? There you go. Uh, we didn't talk about um, you being uh, one of the promoters of Orlando Con, one of the first big conventions. Uh, anything you wanted to say about that? Yeah, that was a great experience. Um, Jim Ivey, uh, Mike Cott, and Neil Austin, and a couple other guys started the Orlando Con somewhere around 70, 71. Yeah. And I was living in Tallahassee at the time and would commute down to that every year. And when I moved down here uh, in 78, I joined with Jim as one of the hosts of the Orlando Con, uh, which was a wonderful convention. We had um, most of the cartoonists, a, a lot of artists retired in Florida, so a lot of really famous artists that were living in Florida at the time. And Jim would invite all of these newspaper strip and uh, uh, political cartoonists uh, to come to the show, and we would have a, a luncheon every Saturday at the show that all these people would attend. And we had probably close to 100 artists at yeah. some of the shows, and uh, over the years we had some of the biggest names in the business, like Joe Kubert and Will Eisner, uh, uh, 
Gil Kane. Gil Kane. Um, uh, <laughs> that we are drawing a blank, but you know, no, uh, Wayne Boring, yeah. um, um, Marty Nadell, who created the Green Lantern. Wayne Boring was a famous Superman artist in the 40s and 50s. Um, Jim yeah. Mooney. You also would bring in celebrities. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we brought in Jock Mahoney, uh, who, who was a guy I loved all my life. Uh, as a little boy, I'd go to the Saturday Night Nays, my, my favorite. Hero was the Durango kid who was played by Charles Starrett. Jock Mahoney was starting his career back then. He doubled for the Durango kid who was this masked character. And we had Jocko in uh, for one year. And I got him to demonstrate how to throw a punch and use Craig's. <laughs> so he was up in, in front of the audience getting punched by Jock Mahoney. That was all right. <laughs> I claim to fame. <laughs> Jock Mahoney was Sally Field's stepfather. That's right. He, he married uh, Margaret Field, who was the leading lady in Man from Planet X. Okay. Uh, Margaret Field, uh, after she married Jocko, she became Maggie Mahoney. And I didn't know that until I got to talk to him. This was 1980 when he was here. You had Bob Cummings, did you one year? Bob Cummings was before that. And um, Bob Clampett, who did Clampett, who did Beanie and Cecil. Uh, I know I'm talking to people who they don't know who it is. <laughs> they, were, they were really big things at the time. They were. Well, we've, we've uh, covered a lot of ground. Maybe there's some questions you guys have about any aspect of Bill's career. What advice would you give to someone who wants to get into comics and illustration? You should have been at the last panel. I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it seems it's a lot of work these days. Uh, it, 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 it was really easy for me. Uh, like I said. Uh, Hey, Sorry. turn your phones off, man. <laughs> uh, I should have announced that. That's my fault. I, I was invited by the editor-in-chief of Marvel to work for them, so I, I, I didn't really even want to do it. Um, but I did it, like I said, because it was something I don't know if I aspired to, but I wish I had done it 10 years earlier. Uh, I guess you go through the conventions today because you're going to have representatives. Are they still doing that? I, I didn't. Marvel, somebody stopped doing that on purpose. Yeah. I'd say that, yeah, you, you got to get your work out there, go to shows, and, get, and put things online, and, you know, you've got to have, you've got to have a passion for it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, in, the, in, the, in the big boom days, there was money in it. I don't know if there's any money in it now. Uh, there wasn't any money in it when I was doing it, when I was working for Marvel. My, my page rates were, for, I was an inker, my, uh, inking a normal pencil page was $25. If I had to do some retouch work on it, it was thirty or thirty-five dollars, and if I had to do a lot of retouch, it was forty dollars. That was the highest page rate, and you'd have to you'd have to spend a day or two. I mean, you, you wouldn't work for that kind of money. Uh, so I mean, it was something that had to be a passion. Are you an artist? Yeah, I'm studying graphic design and studio art. Good. What do you have your own characters? Um, I play around with stuff right now. I'm working with like fantasy fantasy stuff. I'm doing a printmaking series where I'm making a uh, Mashes of different mythical creatures. So what have you done so far? Do you want to do publish your own comic, or do you want to work for somebody else? Or? I'm not sure. Like I'm just seeing what I like. If I like working under someone or making my own characters. I've done stuff like uh, women centaurs, um, mining mermaids and hippogriffs and stuff like that. Just playing around with different things, trying to get out of my box. Yeah. The guy that was here before, John Crowther, he had a character called Rochelle. He has a character called Rochelle, the teenage cockroach. Um, yep. Right? Yep. Uh, he knows Cliff of Cliff Books in the land, and through Cliff, he got up with my company, AC Comics, at the time. And we put out the first Rochelle, the teenage cockroach story. And uh, let me just say, John really needed a, an editor. And, uh, he said a lot of success with it with other companies. Okay. Um, but. Uh, he really pushed it, and he gave a very inspirational speech on how he did everything to get Roche. I mean, if you can sell the teenage cockroach, <laughs> you can sell anything, right? Um, so, I mean, it's just, and if you go to his table, he has these cockroaches all over his table. I mean, it's, it's really a repulsive thing, but he's made a go of it. He really has, and he could tell you how to do it because he was explaining when we walked in on a session. Um, he just does promotions all over the internet, and he sends illustrations of this thing to everybody everywhere. Back when I started, you didn't have that opportunity. Uh, 
working in comics in the 50s and 60s, it was really a closed company, a closed club, okay? They were guys that were doing it from the 30s or 40s, they were still doing it in the 50s and 60s, and they did it until they died, and that's essentially how someone got in, was if somebody else died. Uh, so uh, then you had, in the 70s, you had uh, the guys that were fanboys in the, I should say the 80s, the, the guys were fanboys doing fan art in the 60s and 70s, and now we're working in Marvel and DC doing the real characters. Um, like I said, I, I prefer to have my own characters and draw my own characters, so you should, if you have your own characters, stick to it. And, I mean, who would have thought 35 years later would still be publishing Film Force, but it's still going. I won't say it's going strong, but it's still going. <laughs> uh, but I guess just send it out. You have all the opportunities. Uh, uh, like, my movies don't sell all that well, but I put the trailers up on YouTube, and some of my trailers have done 250,000 hits. You know. So uh, I wish I could sell that many movies. <laughs> but that's for free. You know. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. How long would it, in the beginning, how long would it take for you to create an issue for AC Comics or Fun Force like that? Like, first, like right in the first year? Yeah, the first year, um, it was amazing. Uh, um, the first thing I learned is one guy can't do it all because you have, you have to write it, you have to pencil it, you have to ink it, you have to have it lettered, then you have to have it colored, then you have to have color separations made, which we did mechanically back then. Uh, there weren't computers that you could scan things into and, and do it right. So uh, it, it takes a day to pencil, a day to ink, and uh, you can letter several pages a day, and you can uh, color several pages a day. Uh, so I saw that I had to have a, a group of people, I had to be done like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. So we had to hire a pencil or an inker or a letter or a colorist and all that, and uh, people to do the, the mechanical work. Uh, but you have to get it done in a month. I mean, anything, everything has to be done in a month. You have 30 days for that next book to come out. So, of course, you have to start in advance and have to work at least a month or so ahead of it. So, uh, you, you can't be doing uh, September's book in August. You know, it has to be uh, ahead of the game. And this is where you run into trouble when someone misses a deadline and screws you up. And, and when you say you pencil a page in a day, when the editor looks at it, when you look at it, you see that the storytelling is not right. Yeah, we had a lot. Continuity is not right. We had some of those problems. And, um, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Bill, you, you had hired uh, uh, what, uh, an artist that didn't understand English, and you said a character had crow's feet, <laughs> meaning the lines from the eyes. Yeah. And the page came back with crow's feet on the character. <laughs> but the worst of it, this, this was another guy. Another guy. Uh, couldn't speak English. His name was Eric Larson. Uh, I sent him a script and it had in there that somebody was cuffing somebody. You know, in my vernacular, when you cuff somebody, you know, smack him. Well, the page came back where the guy was wearing handcuffs. <laughs> he cuffed him. <laughs> but he wore <laughs> uh, But uh, if you're doing it on your own, you don't have a deadline. When I was doing the paragraph stuff, I, I could only get like maybe, I, I had a full-time job and I was doing this on the side. Uh, I only put out maybe three books a year. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, no, it was, well, it was, because I know earlier, you said it took three months, you got three issues out a year, but then you were saying the diamond had a 30-day rule. Oh, so. yeah, you got a, a you, you have a 30-day grace period where you, if you solicit something for a diamond, it goes through the catalog, it comes out, and it's supposed to be in that store by a certain time. So you have to get the book to diamond uh, like two weeks before that. So they give you a, a schedule for when that monthly book, when September's book has to be at Diamond's Warehouses. You have a grace period, I think for the entire, what are we at now? 37 years of AC Comics, we've always used that grace period. We never, I don't think, ever got one there. On. We always <laughs> took that 30-day grace period to get it there. Uh, uh, yeah, and if, if it doesn't get it there, then they cancel the book. And holy crap, by that time, you paid for it, you know. And uh, we had a problem. I was using a printer in Texas. And I was calling up Diamond, and I said, hey, man, when am I going to get paid for such and such book? And they said, what do you mean? You never, we never got it. What do you mean you never got it? 
So I called the guy in Texas, and they they printed it, but they never shipped it. Huh. I mean, that right there will put you out of business, you know. So uh, they I don't know why they took it, but they took it down, took it late, and uh, I, maybe that's why they created the rules. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine that it, I'd have to pay for that whole book and it would go in the dumpster, right? I mean, geez, that would put you out of business, as many of the companies did in the, in the mid '80s, uh, and there was a lot of comic book publishers who, who put printers out of business. I think uh, Eclipse, I'm speaking out of school, but uh, I, I think they were kind of notorious for burning printers. They'd ship the books and then they would skip town and uh, not pay the printer. Yeah. A question about distribution. Sure. Now, uh, you said this about what years was this you were talking about? 83. Okay. So, but you still had, um, who are the big distributors then? Who's the big distributor in 83 still? Uh, independent distributors. There was Diamond, so Candle City. So the was still around. Yeah. Okay. There were yeah. 14 in 1983. And they were distributing some of the independent books. All of the independent books, yeah. They were distributing all the independent books. Yeah, pretty much. How did you guys get the, uh, how did you get that company to do that? That Because that was a, that was okay. a big deal. Okay. They were they were only doing the big companies. They weren't doing the small ones. How no. did you guys get them? No, to you're wrong on that. There were no no Marvel, no DC. Independent? We, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the old independent. No. The old independent was still that was uh, Donenfeld's company. I'm sorry. The, this is back in the Atlas. Oh, oh this no, that, that, that was a different company. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. That's yeah, a yeah, you know. okay. All right. Well, who's distributing Marvel and DC? Well, that was, that was newsstand distribution. That's that's different. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Could you? Was there any way that you guys have gotten into newsstand distribution? Uh, we almost did with Crab Man. Um, um, but <laughs> the newsstand distribution. I mean, Diamond is really a sweet deal if you can get into Diamond. Okay, because uh, you sell to them, they order based on uh, orders they get from the store, and they can they can also reorder. But you sell to them, they got it. It's there in their bailiwick. You get your money, and that's it. Not so with newsstand distribution. Newsstand distribution, uh, if you sell 40% of what you print, you're doing good. That means 60% of your print run goes in the dumpster. Uh, so you have to put on a lot of money to get your book printed, and then they'll distribute it. And they pay you kind of before they get the numbers in, and if the numbers don't come in good, then they take over your business. I mean, there's a lot of mob connections in distribution. Um, Charlton Comics, yeah. Santangelo's, it was rumored that they were mob connected. But how I got into Diamond, I was uh, doing fun comics, Bill Black's fun comics, uh, and some guys had a store in uh, Largo, uh, and they started something called New Media Urjax, I-R-J-A-X. I and they wanted me to do fun comics exclusively through them and uh, the Schuster brothers. And uh, there's a lot of stories about them. They got run out of town, I think. But eventually, what, what happened was the, the Schuster brothers had a cousin whose name was Steve Jeppy. And he kind of piggybacked on new media and started Diamond Comics. So I kind of had the inroad right at the beginning there. Um, and uh, no, there was no Marvel in DC. That's that's why there were comic shops, but they they couldn't get their Marvel and DC comics directly from Marvel and DC, and uh, they couldn't get in with the newsstand distribution. So, like I was saying earlier, this this is what happened. The, the independents, all the stores loved getting the independents because they didn't have the other product, or if they had it, they were selling old comics and the uh, fanzines and stuff. So we were providing product for the stores. And uh, when Marvel, after a year or so, they saw that we were successful at this, and they jumped in, and then that killed the independent market after that. And a lot of big companies like First and Eclipse and all that, they, they went belly up. And uh, the distributors, it was funny. Uh, dealing with this, these distributors, there were 14, like I said, in 83 and 84, and when this whole thing crashed. Um, one guy left the country, I guess he was in so much debt. And uh, we had to settle with full, Phil Sewing. We had a, an arbitrator, and I took so much on the dollar for the money he owed me. And um, um, 
One guy left the country, uh, one guy, uh, well, all of them went out of business with Bangkok. Um, it was a, a horrible thing. I mean, we were sitting on, imagine selling 40, 30, 40,000 copies of something every month, and I was doing it like two or three titles a month. I mean, I, there was a lot of, I won't say I made any money, but I would say a lot of money went through the AC bank, bank account in 80 okay. A lot of money I had. Uh, I had ten grand in my business account at all times in, in that year, and then the whole thing just tanked. It was just gone dead. And I, I was lucky that I, I didn't go out of business and, and kept it going, but so many of them did. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We're, about that. We're done. Yeah. Okay. Are we out of time? We got, we got to test the. Uh a uh, projector. Go for it. Yes. All right. Well, thank well, you guys for, for coming by. Uh, tomorrow, Bill's going to be talking about his movies and the people that he's worked with and the fun that he's had. Everybody knows me, and uh, this is uh, Craig Zablo and Drew McCann. Uh, Good Drew's to see you, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Hello. He's a documentary filmmaker of great talent. And Zablo has been to many movies. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. Is that thing running? Yeah. yeah it's, you know, I'm picking my teeth, so it's immortalized. It's right? the they could cut that out of the, the <laughs> part of the experience. Oh, charge hey, more for that. Uh, we need to get Joel, Joel Winecoop, Wine over Kathy. here, and his wife Kathy. All right. And then you're coming, right? Thank you, thank you. All right, bye. Then we can get started. Okay. Start. Hello? Yeah. Good <laughs> yeah. afternoon again. Okay. Are we starting without Joel? I must be going. <laughs> <laughs> How long I must be going? Yeah. Groucho? Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. Like Stafford is that one, too. <laughs> Duck suit, man. <laughs> Ask a question. Or say something about getting us started. Do you want to get started? Yeah, I'm ready. You guys ready? Yeah, they're ready. We're ready. All right. Definitely ready. Um, I don't know if anybody was here yesterday or not, but Bill did it. Uh, we did a, a, an interview with Bill, and he talked about his comic career. And growing up, Bill was a comic and movie fan, and he's been very fortunate in his life that he's been able to do both. Uh, he started off as a comic fan. Uh, he had one of the has one of the longest running independent comic companies. It is. Uh, it is now the longest running. Yes. And uh, along the way, especially since the digital age, he started going back and fixing movies that he had started filming way back in the 60s on some of them. Yep. So why don't you talk about, about how you got started in the 60s? Well, if you want to go back to your childhood in the age, I'm here. But uh, tell them how you got started and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of the old monster movies that they made in the 50s. And I, yeah. Um, Every weekend between 1956 and 59, pretty much you could go to a double bill, at least during the summer. So I decided that I would like to try making one myself because I saw some movies like Astounding Sheep Monster, a movie that you would say, hey, even I could make a better movie than that, you know. So, uh, of course, I haven't. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started in 1959 when I was in high school to make my own movies and uh, made two or three for when I was in high school, more than that, I guess. And then uh, when I went to Florida State as an art major, I made a considerably better movies there. Oh, is this a, I thought you had that door locked. <laughs> I can go back right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Joel Weinkoop. Woo! Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, so, so, a ton of yes, Bill, why don't you finish telling how you got started, and Joel can tell how he got started, 
That's a good idea. Maybe, go. maybe we'll let Drew say something too. Okay. There you go. Okay. He's got Captain uh, America Shield. Where I was uh, in at Florida State, I, I made some movies. There was no film program at Florida State when I was there, and uh, I made a film. I talked to the head of the art department uh, into doing a film as a project for one of my classes, and I may have been one of the first people at uh, Florida State to make a movie, uh, you know, other than the professional guy that hired to film the sports activities. That would have been around '64. Um, I, I have a good story about that. Uh, there was, uh, Florida State's very old. It was built, gosh, turn of the century, the last century, uh, at least in the 1920s. Some of the buildings are very uh, architecturally like what you might find in a Dracula movie. So I thought, hmm, this would be great to shoot a Dracula movie on, uh, on campus. Uh, so I went to the guy who was in charge of uh, the film uh, shooting the uh, Seminole football games. Uh, he was reputed to have been a Luftwaffe pilot in World War II. So this gives you a little hint as to his personality. So I went in to see him and uh, my girlfriend at the time had an older sister who was uh, at the school. and She accompanied me and we went in to see this guy. Uh, she's became a librarian, so you know, her personality is just like Joel's. Uh, she's very mousy. So uh, <laughs> I, I talk to this guy and I, I say, I, I would like to know if I could borrow a 16 millimeter camera so I could shoot a movie on campus. Uh, all I had was 8 millimeter, uh, and he, he absolutely exploded. He just went ballistic and he used the F-bomb on me and here's like a guy <laughs> in the administration at Florida State University. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is 1964. Uh, nobody said that out loud. He just, but he was a Luftwaffe pilot, so he shot you down? No, he <laughs> shot you down big time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here's Kathy. I was Kathy Wynkoop, come on. I was sorry. Come up here. <laughs> but don't kick over the camera. I won't go around this way, see? Okay. Uh, so anyways, he literally threw me out of his office. and. Uh, I was stunned. I had never been through anything like that. And I was standing outside of his office, which was on the second floor, and there was an atrium in the middle of his building. And as I was standing there stunned, I, I started looking around and thought, yeah, this really would make a good Dracula location. So I got to, my roommate at the time, we lived off campus, was an actor, and he had the Dracula cape. He always wanted to be Dracula. He was a big Dark Shadows fan and all that. He got together an ensemble of uh, actors from the Tallahassee Little Theater. and. Um, we planned on doing this Dracula movie. He and I wrote a script, and uh, this is true. Uh, Florida State was on a trimester system, and I would work a trimester and then go to school a trimester and to pay for the, the next terms and so on. So at this time, I actually was not a registered student at Florida State, but I checked this building out and nobody went there on the weekends. <laughs> so I drive up from Orlando to Tallahassee and get together with my crew, and we hit, hit, hit this building early in the morning, and uh, I mean, there's like two female leads, uh, Dracula, the guy that gets killed by Dracula, and the professor who also gets killed by Dracula, a makeup guy. We have a coffin, a full-size coffin, and we have a uh, folding bed, and uh, one of those stands with the blood thing on it, you know, to give the <laughs> So we go into the building, we just start shooting the movie, we filmed the whole damn movie, the whole damn day. Not a single soul <laughs> came into the, you know, building, and, we got no interruptions and shot this thing. It was uh, the best movie I, I made to date on that. And uh, this was literally right beneath the office of this guy that kicked me out. So it was, like <laughs> was this the one that was on a special feature of it was. I got from you? And it yeah. was called Carnage of Dracula. Yeah, okay. Now, this <laughs> Carnage of Dracula uh, is unique in that it features neither Dracula nor any Carnage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so then, um, okay, that was college. Then I got drafted into the Army, and um, we made several movies while I was in the Army, uh, including an anti-war movie. And I did a couple of horror movies, which featured as the female leads, they were just teenagers, um, the daughter of a colonel and uh, the daughter of the commanding officer, General Gramling, of <laughs> Fort Stewart, where I was. They were in it, and boy, we all would—I don't know what would happen if her dad ever found out about it. But uh, 
then after, after the Army, I went to work for a film production company in Orlando. And after that, went to Tallahassee where my wife was uh, on the faculty of Florida State and I was working at the Media Center and uh, making films, uh, slide pre presentations uh, for the president and for various teachers and all that. And uh, I worked for an advertising agency and did some video work for Florida A&M. Uh, then I uh, did some freelance work for Marvel Comics while I was doing freelance work for a guy that I was an artist for when I first got out of the Army in Orlando. And he hired me to come back to Orlando. We moved back where I was working at the film production company that uh, he was uh, with uh, for eight years. And uh, the corporate office closed down the film production wing and then I started AC Comics. Uh, I started making uh, digital movies when digital came out. Uh, I, I did make a movie in Tallahassee called Astron, which was um, an actual professional movie. We had a film crew from Peter Barton Studios and uh, you know, 16 millimeter Airflex sound, everything, uh, uh, clapboard, uh, recorders, everything. I was uh, delusional thinking I could make a children's Saturday morning uh, uh, TV show. For, uh, because uh, Shazam and uh, ISIS were so awful. And, you know, I thought anybody could do something better than that. I think we did do a better one, but of course that's not how you get into Hollywood or anything like that. So uh, you just give them a paragraph description of what you want to make and they'll kick you out the door. Uh, so uh, when the digital stuff came out uh, around 2002, I started making these uh, movies. And uh, almost all of the movies are uh, featured characters from the comic books that I created, so uh, like um, Stormy Tempest, Crest of the Moss Monster, and also uh, Fight for the Future, those are both two features, and uh, Nyoka the Jungle Girl was an old character from the Republic serials that became a comic book character that was owned by Charlton. When they went out of business, I bought the rights to Nyoka from them, and so we did uh, four Nyoka movies. Uh, one of the most popular ones is the Garganta, which we featured in our Film Force comic. Uh, she's a giant woman, and there's a group of people who <laughs> like giant women. And, uh, so this this sold better. I mean, we did three three of these uh, Garganta movies, and they did pretty good. Uh, so, like I said, to date I've released about 30 movies, and I have six that have been shot that are in the post-production stage now. And have been for many years. <laughs> nice. So, Joe, how'd you get started? First of all, thank you for your service to our country. <laughs> yes. And that goes to any, any vets here? Who's all vets? <laughs> you, have hear, no, okay. you have to hear an extended version of my two-year period in the Army. It's just thrilling. <laughs> But I, I think what it's neat what you've done because you started with like the comic books and then put them into the movies, but also that working for Marvel and then and then starting your own comic company. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. I see comics. So give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Really, folks, honestly, I'd rather have money than applause. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Joel. Um, I don't know. I just, I, um, when I was a kid, I liked all the, like, Godzilla and King Kong and... I got the Starlog, and Fangoria wasn't around yet, but Starlog, Monsters of, uh, Famous, Monsters. Famous Monsters of Filmland, and in one of those was where it showed, of course, King Kong, the armature, how you move each little frame, and then I found out Godzilla was a man in a suit, and I said, wow, that's cool, and then I told my dad I would like to make like a, like a movie, and he took me to the... Uh, uh, it was a pipe shop, but they also had as a camera. No, it was a camera shop. And we bought. He bought me a Super 8 camera, and I went home. And I think the first thing we I did a little thing for school with a little animated mm -hmm. monster, and I put him on my train board, <laughs> and I would move him, move him a little bit. So when you know you do the four clicks, just like King Kong was, when it puts together, it'll move across the board. And the first thing I did was I wanted him on fire, so I put this like gasoline all over the creature, and then I lit him on fire. And we're shooting it, and my buddy goes, how are you going to move it? I go, I don't know. And I, just, I reached in and I go, whoa, that's not a good idea. And then I did something to get it moving, but the flame was dying down, and then I had a Tupperware container, and I said, 
needs more fire on him. And I went like that, and my buddy goes, no! And the gasoline came out, hit the flame. The flame trailed up the gasoline, blew up the container in my hand. My hand caught on fire. This is when I was in high school. And then spun around, put my hand out. My buddy goes, man, are you all right? And I go, you know, I know how the human torch feels. <laughs> and fantastic Four. And he knew that. He goes, yeah, there's nothing wrong with him. Um, but we did that. But and then um, did the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then um, I did, uh, did, did that, put that all together. So the monster, we finally was able to make him climb over the table. And then we had brought dinosaurs into it. I think that was another one we did my... Neighbors dinosaurs, my neighbor, eight years my old, Tim Ritter. He had all these dinosaurs, and this is how Tim and I met, because he lived across the street from me back in, uh, in the 70s, 74 or something. Then we got together, and I think, oh, then my neighbor Steve Campbell, I took the same camera, and then we, uh, Steve and I did a couple of movies where I was like a gargantua guy. I was at, oh, in a lab, and I spilled I stuff, and I was supposed to grow, and obviously oh, you can see it was in, a, in his house, you know, the, I'm like, Rawr, the big monster, but in the background was the bed. <laughs> and then we went out in his backyard, and he built this elaborate model city with cars and matchboxes and Hot Wheel tracks and stuff. And I tore through that and you know, picked the pieces up, and then I think the film ran out, and we never finished that movie. But then we did The Bionic Boy. The $8 million boy meets the transport boy, and that's where Steve was. Could turn invisible, but also transport. My nephew Mark was the Bionic Boy. And we did a whole thing, and I even took shots off of Six Million Dollar Man, then I yeah. right off the television, I did that and, too. and spliced it into the movie. <laughs> I did that. Too. Yeah, put that all in the movie, and then um, did a whole bunch of Super Eight movies with my neighbor Steve and I. And I think Tim had moved away, and then we moved away. And then ten years, I came back to the location, and my nephew said, "There's this guy named Tim Ritter. He's selling a movie called Day of the Reaper in my school." And I go, "I wonder if that's a Tim Ritter I used to take care of way back in the '70s." And called him up, and he goes, he said, yep, it's me. We got together, and then we planned a movie called, uh, um, no, before we did that, we did uh, Inner Forces. And Tim gives me the script, he goes, this is it, man, it's going to be Inner Forces, the name, and here's the script. And I'm reading the script, and I'm going, how are we going to make that preacher explode into flames and bats fly out of him? He's like, I don't know, but we're going to do it. I'm going, I don't think we can do this, man. And then he showed his mom, and his mom goes, honey, how are you going to do all these effects? Okay, we won't do them. So we did, I wrote three shorts, and he wrote three shorts, and he had a wraparound, and we called it, and then he said, we got to come up with the title name, and we were on the phone, and he said, how about something like Twisted, and I was like, yeah, and I went through all the slew of names, and then I came up with Illusions, and then we got Twisted Illusions, and then we did um, Twisted Illusions, the movie, but also our company name, and then we released that movie, just driving it, we put it on VHS then, days of VHS, drove around all the video stores, but starting when... I would start with in Fort Pierce, and we drive all the way down to Miami, just hit as many video stores as we could, taking it in, selling it. Then we go the next day. We go from my house from Fort Pierce all the way up into Satellite Beach and beyond, all all the places in between, going off side roads, dirt roads, whatever, going anywhere to sell this movie. Then sent that to Peerless Films with Jeff Miller. He liked the last episode and called Tim to come up there. Now I, I had moved. I went to Pensacola. Thought the whole thing was dead. Tim's calling me every day. Yeah, now they want this. Then Tim flew there to uh, Chicago, met with uh, Jeff, made a handshake deal. Next thing we know, we had a million dollars, and we were about a million dollars, and we were making Truth or Dare. And that was Yale Wilson came down and uh, from Death Wish, and um, uh, Jeff Miller, Bob Shelley from Ghostbusters, and um, Invasion USA, he was coming down, Jerry Berry from Prom Night, and uh, a lot of those horror movies that he was a stuntman came down. So I got to work with them, which was cool. And one of the things, uh, when we were doing Truth at Air, I was doing the stunt work, so Jerry says, run across the field, jump onto the hood of the car, and then kick the driver in the face. <laughs> Miss the driver, but kick the driver in the face. And I would run, jump up on the hood of the car, but catch my balance, throw the kick, and he would go, no, land on the hood of the car and kick! I'm like, oh, okay. And I go and I run and I jump on the hood of the car and I brace myself again, and then throw the kick. He goes, No! Run on the run on the ground, jump on the hood and kick! So the fourth or fifth time they kept going, cut, do it again, do it again, Joel, get it right. And he's yelling at me, come on, get on the hood of the car and kick! So I landed on the car, kicked the guy square in the face, and he went flying <laughs> back, hit the car, fell down, rolled around, like, oh shit, I might as well just go for it now. Got in the car and raced around him and out of the parking lot. Everybody's like, yay! And I come back, and I'm helping, I go, Al, I'm so sorry. He keeps yelling at me. He goes, oh, I got kicked in the face. Yes. I'm sorry, but he's yelling at me, and he's mad. And I'm getting up there, all right, let's take another take. He's not kicking me in the face again.
<laughs> yeah. So from there, it just turned into, we did Truth and Air, and then into Killing Spree, and then Lost Faith, and then Wicked Games, and then it's just been just one movie after the other, um, and then, you know, over in the, the West Palm area, and then when I moved to Tampa, it just really opened up, because a lot of filmmakers were over here in Tampa, and when I came over, it was cool, because I was treated as a star at first, I'd come over and somebody would see me at the gas station, and they'd be like, oh, the dude from Creep! Then four weeks from then, you see me in the crystal water truck. So what? So <laughs> it was cool for a while. But then just did a bunch of movies then, started meeting other filmmakers, John Lewis, and then eventually I met Bill. Bill had me up for two of his Angel Avenger movies at one point, met Jason LaCorey. Herschel Gordon Lewis was awesome to work for. Got to work for him, because uh, we watched all his movies. And I was telling him, like, oh, I watched your movies when I was a kid, just like people were telling me when I was in uh, Wisconsin shooting a movie. Uh, and she's always telling me, she goes, don't, this isn't your place to tell them how to make their movie. Just shut your mouth. And I'm sitting there, you know, trying to, I'm mean, hearing her in my ear, even though she's back in Tampa. And I finally broke down. And I asked these guys, I go, look, would you like some advice how to do this? And they're, oh, God, 35 years of experience. Yes, tell us. So <laughs> it worked out a whole fight scene for me, and it worked out really cool. But uh, working for Herschel Gordon Lewis was awesome. And then Bill Griffey, I said, I just worked for him. That did Stan Lee and Mako Jaws of Death all back in the, like, 58, 62 or something. And, uh, but there's absolutely no money in it. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> it's really scrounging. So I, I act and I produce, and then I met my wife at the time, not my wife, but asked her to marry me. And then she showed an interest into. Um, I was acting well, you tell that. Well, no, I'm just saying I was mm -hmm. acting before I met you. Okay. <laughs> but I got more, speak, I got more speak, things. Speak, speak, right. speak. Uh, no, I just. I don't want him to say that because then you all think, oh, she's only in it because she's married to him. But no, I By actually. Say, yeah. I just, I actually <laughs> that's what I got out of it. No. <laughs> you no I always <laughs> liked acting. I did it in high school. I did it shortly after high school. I got more opportunity when I got with him. But yeah. Slipped out the director. I did. <laughs> Slept my way to the middle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see? yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's how it works. No, but. Um, so how many movies have you been in? Uh, listed so far on IMDb is 44, but I've got about three or four that I just did scenes for in January and February. Yeah. They're still slow at IMDb. Yeah, they're not out yet. And um, one was just released a month ago, Truth or Dare, five. Nothing to do with Bloomhouse. They copied their Truth or Dare in 1985, just so you all know. This is Truth or Dare, five. Sorry, Truth or Dare, five. Um, <laughs> and, um, Three of the movies that we're in are actually going to premiere in Tampa at Tampa Bay Screams. If any of, any of you are into horror, uh, like Animator, Truth or Dare 5, and Discord 3 are all three movies that will be coming out. So that's kind of cool, those that come out this year. Oh yeah, and next week, if you're in St. Pete, <laughs> I'm sure we did, called Battle Suit, which is not horror, but it's action and sci-fi. That is premiering at Sunscreen next Sunday, actually. So. So how long does it take to film one of these movies? For the feature? Film it or get it out? No, film it. Production of it. Well, it depends. Um, we did The Bite, which is a full-length feature in eight days. Um, I guess it just depends on really what kind of movie it is. Because we, we did The Wine Coop Tales that had four short stories, and that was over a few years because it was like, well, one short took a day. Another short took a day. Diary of Blood took three or four days, and then Dead End took two days, and then the Ride Around took what, half a day. <laughs> All depends on. But how it many, just depends on, yeah. How, uh, many, now, how long did it take to write those before you shot them? Well, he uh, doesn't use the script. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. But I prefer not. Not all the time. But no, in really? um, in in just talking about wine cocktails was there was uh, John Miller who's another filmmaker who did Crack Baby Billionaire, which I'm in. And uh, he called me up. This is before he did Crack Baby and was doing his own movies, Scumbags. Um, he was just starting out doing movies. Yeah, and they're they're really they're. Yes. Yeah, my mine might get bloody and, and there's some nudity and stuff, but John's were like really in the streets and drug dealers and hookers and different breed of. But whatever. Yeah. You get the name from Scumbags and. So he called me up before he did all these. He called me up and he goes, he goes, I want, I want, I want you to be in a movie. And Chris is gone, so I, I bought my own camera. And I want you and Kathy to be in it. 
And I kind of twisted it on him because as we were there shooting it, he goes, I want you to say this. And it was just so super vulgar. I go, let me just say this, which is not even close to that. So we did do that. And uh, we just shot that in a day. And uh, Kathy played my wife. And it's, it starts out funny because it's a newlywed couple. And as we come back to the apartment, he goes, baby, I love you. We're going to move you out of this apartment. Everything's going to be great. And we do a whole schmoopy thing from Seinfeld. You're my schmoopy. <laughs> and then it, it shows us disappear. And it fades to black. And then it picks up uh, seven weeks later. And I come in the door. And she's like, hi, baby. And I'm like, hi. How's it going? Oh, I lost my job today. And she's like, oh, no. So then they have a discussion, oh, I'll get a job, it can't be that hard. And then it's like 14 weeks later, coming in, and she's, did you get a job? No, shut up, I don't need a job. <laughs> and then it goes into like the 23rd week or whatever, three weeks later, whatever it is. Then he comes home and he's going, well, you've been doing it all day, you stupid bee. And I've gotten these pennies trying to buy a gallon of milk, shut up. And then they're arguing and fighting, and then, then he, um, really? he says, I, find, I found a way to, to get the bills paid. And she goes, oh, great, honey. And he opens his door, and this big, huge guy comes walking in with a briefcase, and he goes, you got the, bubba, the money, Bubba? And he goes, yeah, and he hands over the briefcase. I open it up, it's all full of money, and I sell her. And I go, now I got all the money in the world. She goes, well, now, you, now, you, now we don't have to move out. We can work. And he goes, no, you're going with Bubba. i am got to take it to L.A. And when that played, there was a guy's horror movie playing at it. This was at uh, the Tampa Film Review, and he had this this real bad guy beating the kids, killing the wife, and, and he showed that, it didn't show it as graphic as, as some of my stuff has been, but then, then his played, and then that one played, and then he came up to me and goes, man, you went a lot further than I could have ever went, <laughs> something like this, but so we did it a long time ago, and then I, I had that, and then I did a movie for Joe Sherlock called Diary of Blood, he paid me to, to shoot it, edit, and everything, okay. I did it, no, I didn't have to edit it, that's what I was excited about. I sent all the tapes to him because it was all on uh, uh, Sony mini digital tapes. And I sent it to him, and I would call him up every once in a while, Joe, did you, did you get that movie done? Uh, no, not yet, not yet. Well, this went on for an entire year, me saying, Joe, did you get that movie done? Finally, I said, Joe, look, I'm, I'm going to buy all the rights from you, and I want to buy the digital tapes back. I'm going to release it because you're jerking around on this way too long. Okay, Joe, I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. Here's the money, get me the tapes. Tapes come back, three days later the whole movie's done, cut and put together. I go, it took you a year, it took me three days. And then so we had that done, and then what was the other one? Cycles Are Us. Cycles Are Us was picking up a friend of mine, Anthony, had moved to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. back to Puerto Rico. And he said he's coming back from Puerto Rico, kind of pick him up at the airport. And Anthony, and you know Anthony, we yeah, worked yeah, on your movies too. Well, I went to the airport, picked him up at the airport, <laughs> went to the hotel, got a cheap hotel room for him, so for him to stay at. And then got a hold of Kathy, uh, Ashley Lynn Caputo, Kelly Helen Thompson, Anthony and I went to the hotel. And that hotel was the worst. There was, I don't know what was going on next door. I really if, you, if you watch the, the movie, you hear screaming and stuff in the background. That, that wasn't anything that we did. <laughs> That's <laughs> just the atmosphere. Uh, oh, we shot on Steve Owen. We shot that in one night. And then when Dead End came up, uh, and this is why I always say everybody help everybody that's an actor, help each other. A uh, buddy of mine, uh, we were leaving a, a place where we just uh, were reading his script and everybody liked it and blah, blah, blah. He had came back, got, he forgot to drop the key off as he left. He got hit by another car, doing 60, smashed him into a telephone pole, put him in the hospital. The only thing he was concerned, the guy can't even move hardly. And he's like all tracked up and everything. He's like, oh, Joel, I guess I can't do the movie now. And I go, dude, you're worried about the movie? You just get, you're lucky to be alive. And he wanted to get his money back, and I go, no, man. I go, I'm going to give you my script, and you do. And he goes, oh, thanks. What are you going to do? I go, don't worry about me. I'm going to write another script for me. So we had Battlesuit and Nakoda. Wait, no, not Nakoda. Dead End. Dead End. And then I wrote another script, which was Dead End. Which is, that's the one you saw where she, she does a lot of fighting. I said, you want to you wanna fight in a full feature? I'm going to put you through a 20-minute fights thing. So I put her in that to fight with that. And then those became the wine coop tales. And then we went up one day to Target Printing and Copy with my partner's yeah, the store. The yep, and did the and did the wrapper on there. And I, I went on way too long, but you were talking about this. And I never did find out how long it takes you to write a script. We did. Dead, <laughs> dead End took um, probably, yeah, you have to keep me on track. Maybe two, two days to write Dead End, a little 20 minutes short. And then we shot it on the property. I kept telling everybody, we'll get it done if we stay on my schedule. And we did really good, but we just ran out of sunlight. And I said, Everybody can come back. As I said, if we don't get it done, we're going to have to come back the next day. And then next day we came back and shot it. So we finished that whole thing in two days. But it's just a little 20 minutes short. But Well, even it was shorter for the AFC. It was 15. And then I added in some other stuff for, for my release. So it was 20 minutes. 
So, but bigger things, lost faith, took me 12 days on weekends. Um, like the, she said, the bike completely, uh, my partner taught me how to do everything on index cards. So you put down Monday the 12th, Tuesday the 13th, Wednesday the 14th. The shooting schedule. He's the shooting about, schedule. He's yeah. About writing. Well, and then, then writing it, lost faith. Lost faith took, um, I remember writing that when I was at uh, Armelini. So it just gives probably a couple general months, three, 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 four months on Lost Faith. Because, but you don't. Know, <laughs> uh, I would take that script with me everywhere. So I'd go over to my mom's, I had my script out, and I was writing the script. Then I went into work, and we were doing stuff at Armelini. I whipped my script out and start writing the script. I always carried the script with me. I wish I could do like I did then because I was more um, uh, Productive. motivated. Productive. Yeah, because I would not. Now I'm like, oh, it's too much work. <laughs> but it just it just depends on what, you know, if you, you sit in Nakota, when I did Nakota, I just sat down. I think I, I knocked that out in a day. It was all done in a day because the guy kept calling me and going, why don't you just enter in a contest? Enter in a contest. I go, I don't want to. I don't, I'm not interested. I don't want to. He goes, this is the last night. I go, geez, don't call me no more. I'll write a script. Six hours later, I had Nakota done. And I never thought it would win. But out of 20 scripts, they called me in three weeks. And they go, your script's the best. We're going to shoot your movie for you. And then we shot the movie, got it all done. I showed it to her. <coughs> she looked at it and she goes, we don't want our name attached to this. Take it off. And I'm like, oh my God, all this for <laughs> nothing. Out of your mind. So now it's, well, it's back to me. Everything reverted back to me. So it's my you know, I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, this is great. This is the best thing we ever see. You know what? We, have, we can't do it. Yeah. And we come back and say, this is the best. This is amazing. This piece of shit. What are you doing giving this to me? What's for, that first, when they saw it, everybody applauded at the end. Then she took it home and watched it on her big screen. And then she decided it wasn't good enough for their, <laughs> their production, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, and wrong. then she told me that. And I go, and then I kind of was like choice words. Because I was like, are you kidding me? After you told me you needed this, and I rushed to get it done by your deadline, and then I get it there. And then, and then the editor quits in the middle of the, of the, of the editing, doesn't want to edit anymore. And I have to convince him. Or get, I tell them give me all the footage, and then still go back and convince them to do all my special effects. Give it to me. I got to cut the whole thing together. I got to lay down all the audio, any special effects, bring in other special effects from it, turn it over to you, and now you tell me you don't want it. But that's fine because then I keep it, and then I do it. That's all yours. Yeah. Let's hear from Drew McKinnon. Sorry, Joe. Oh, Drew. Drew. <laughs> Sorry. You're Joel. I'm Joel. <laughs> he knew one of them was. I thought I was Drew. <laughs> No, he draws. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, basically, I got into filmmaking. You know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so seeing movies like Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, stuff like that, obviously made me want to be a filmmaker. Um, I didn't start making anything until after college. I started making parody movies. Uh, so I made an Indiana Jones spoof, a uh, Batman spoof, a uh, Star Trek spoof. Um, after that, I decided to make a mockumentary about the guy that starred in all these spoofs, as if he was a Hollywood star of parody movies. Yeah. Um, and then that turned out pretty cool, so I decided, well, maybe I might want to try making documentaries. Uh, so after a few years, I did a, a web series for a little while, and then after a few years, I decided I was going to make a documentary. Uh, it just actually finished last year. It's about um, the connection between depression and, and comedy, like stand-up comics. Uh, and then after that, I ended up meeting Bill because I was in one of his movies and wanted to make a documentary about that. Um, Bill, Which movie? Uh, what was it, Gargantua? Uh, you, oh, okay. were, you, you were in um, Amazing Colossal Woman yeah. and uh, you were in a couple of them. Um, Never mind. I'm I was, I was a guy movie. at the Sunrail Station. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so I. Uh, that was good, though. That was a good. I asked Bill oh, if I could make a documentary on him, and I've been working on that for the last year. Seven or eight years. Cool. Yeah. Um, you made you pick stand-up comics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why stand-up comics? Because uh, they seem like like to have the darkest side of comedians, um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of see what was uh, like the thing about comics being depressed and stuff like that. I wanted oh, to kind of explore depressed. that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it'd be an interesting subject. Um, that's pretty much uh, what I've been doing. And um, all to everybody, what what do you do for distribution? Do you, do you, have you had any? Uh, I haven't had it yet. Um, I'm still I'm still uh, putting my uh, documentary in film festivals and stuff. I haven't got them distributed. Okay. Um, our first one was uh, Subrosa Studios with Ron Bach out of New Jersey. 
uh, when we finished, um, I think the first, well, our first one was Peerless Films out of Chicago with Jeff Miller, because they put up all the money for Truth or Dare Critical Matters. And then Killing Spree, we got a um, uh, investment capitalist to put in 75000 uh, sold out movie, and it went to Cannes too. And then the part where the ladies, the head turns into a big pair of lips and go over the guy's head and the milk spills out, everybody walked out of the room. <laughs> but um, uh, that got picked up by Sub Rosa Studios. Then as we were shooting Killing Spree, um, my scenes were done, so I started shooting Lost Faith. The Lost Faith I distributed on my own, and then we went into Wicked Games, and as soon as we finished that, we got our distributor again, Sub Rosa Studios, Ron Bach. And he picked up most of our movies. And then a lot of the other ones that I work for are working for other directors who, you know, like um, uh, Media Blasters. They distributed the auto show until Media Blasters went under. And um, when it, with uh, John Lewis, I think uh, 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 Nick Cuddy released that under, under his name. And so it was just, and then any of my movies, uh, um, Chris's company, uh, the Sleaze Box, picked up, uh, picked up a lot of my movies. So they're our distributor. So, and Cult Movie Mania, yeah, Cult Movie Mania, well, the kind of problems we had towards the end, are all washed away because what they did for me, because they got uh, Lost Faith out more than I could have done, because then they got it all over the country and all over the world and everything. So do you give them master copies and they produce the copies and uh, distribute them? Yeah, Lost Faith, I actually went back to my three quarter inch tapes and then went to a dubbing house. And, which is an Ebor, and they actually took my three-quarter tapes that I used way back in the 80s to do Lost Faith and put that on to one, I think one video master. And then, because I, th I think they couldn't do the DVD, or, or they may have done the, no, then I had to take that to someone else to do the DVD master. And then gave that to them uh, to send it off to their distributor, or the, the guy that would make the files, because they were the distributor to make the DVD. But then I even re took it back and recut the movie again, and then re-released it again through them. So then you get a percentage of what they sell? Yeah, then I would get a, a very small percentage of what they would sell. Because they would sell Lost Faith, of course, they're, they're putting in all the money, they're putting in the, they're making the covers, they're making the DVD, they're making the glass master. They're putting up all the money, they're taking out all the ads. So by the time you make something on the movie, I'm getting maybe a check for a dollar a DVD. So it's it's never a lot, sometimes less, depending on. So um, the one with Sub Rosa, uh, I kind of signed over my rights to Tim because it's when we were starting out with Truth That Air, who, who, who I would never have thought then that I'd still be doing movies now, way back in 1984, doing our first movie, whatever thing we'd still be doing it. So when Tim says, well, you got to sign these contracts, you know, just in case, and I would sign it to Tim, so that leaves me out. But my distributor and I have a deal where I can still take my movies to my shows, I can sell them on the website. Because okay, yeah. he knows I'm not liking competition, because most people are going to go to the website, they're going to go to suburbs to studios. If they want to get it from an actor that's in the movie, that's where I say, come, come get yeah. it from the actor that's in the movie. Sign it. Yeah. Okay, I, um, I have my own website and mostly sell um, my DVDs and downloads of some of my movies on the website. And also, I've contracted with a uh, Roku channel. Uh, I have eight of my movies are on three or four Roku channels. And like you said, that really pays great. I, I just got a uh, I deposited on my PayPal account uh, for $45. <laughs> <laughs> That's better yeah. than I get. Dude. Yeah. All our stuff, I forgot about that. All our stuff is on Roku. And what are the other ones that are those? Netflix, yeah, well, Netflix, Netflix. We, were, we were on Netflix. Amazon. When, when they were still doing Amazon. Yeah, we're on Amazon, yeah. Amazon Prime. A lot of my movies are on that. Yeah. But still, like he said, if he's getting 45, he's getting a lot more than I get. Well, Sometimes I get a check. I, four different I, channels. Yeah, I, I get a check from Sleazebox. Joel, you did good. I sold some Slasher Weekends. Here's a check for $1.78. Woo! Mm -hmm. Rolling it in now. And then the Roku channel, sometimes they're like 78, 85 cents. So I have it on. There's another channel. Uh, where the guy hasn't contacted me since they gave my rights to Lost Faith back. Lost Faith and The Bite are on it. It's some, some website you can look it up and purchase the movies off there. But it's, it's just so little coming in. So. Yeah, there's, like comics, there's not much money in it. But, um, Unless you're really, really good. What, what I did when I got serious about uh, making movies based on the comic book characters, I didn't have time to do it because I was publishing monthly. Uh, I had to get a book out every 30 days or two books out. Uh, and our books are 80 pages and 160 pages, so it's a hell of a lot of work. 
Uh, so I didn't have time to do anything on the movie, so I actually hired a guy who was a fan, who uh, was a, uh, he, as a, for a living, he, he made websites for people. Uh, and uh, he had never made a movie before, and I asked him if he knew anything about digital cinema and all that, and he didn't, but he learned fast. So uh, eventually I hired him full time uh, to do the movies. And uh, I started out writing, producing, and directing. And eventually, uh, he did a lot of that. He wrote a lot of the scripts because he knew all the Film Force characters and he knew uh, the ins and outs of what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And that worked out really good. That lasted for several years. Um, and uh, I mentioned the giant women, the, the fans of giant women. It, it takes a lot of time to um, cultivate a cult following, okay? And we did some things in our movies that, as far as uh, cinematic um, expression goes, uh, fails miserably because we had to cater to these fetish people who wanted to see these giant women and they had specific things that they wanted <laughs> oh, to see. God. But it, it paid off because um, we, would, we would shoot a movie, we, I, could, I, I made several features in three days. and. Uh, there's a lot of action and a lot of activity going on, and uh, this fight for the future, this may have taken four days, but this is the most spectacular one we did where we have a, a character, uh, Lady Liberty, who is much like Supergirl, and then she gets the airplane and saves it. And, yeah, that was uh, awesome. Lifts cars and yeah, drives cars cool. and does that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, John Gottschall is the guy I hired. He did all those effects uh, in that. Uh, so. But back to the giant women thing, uh, he spent most of his time catering, you know, emailing, writing back and forth. So these people would be primed when the movie would come out and they'd buy it. And uh, my movies are very inexpensive to make. Uh, most of the features are like uh, in the $2,000 range or less. Um, Shadow Slayer, which I think is the best movie I made, that cost $600 and all the money went to the actors because I had all the equipment and I, I planned everything, so we, we shot that movie in two days. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a feature, it was, uh, it was 40 minutes. So anyways, uh, the fetish people would come through. Uh, when we got the film out, we'd get two grand, three grand in, in a couple of days. I'm doing pretty good on eBay. Uh, I love the downloads because you don't have to do anything. They just <laughs> put money in my PayPal account and you <laughs> download your movie and I don't have to do anything. <laughs> But I, I manufacture all the films myself. I have uh, um, DVD, multi-DVD burners, and I uh, burn the copies and print the discs, and I design and print the wrappers and buy the boxes in bulk and put the material together. So it's a, a print-on-demand. Uh, when someone buys a movie on eBay, I go into my office and make the print and mail out to pretty much the same day. Um, but there's, I imagine that we'd be making like fifty thousand dollars, you know, on every movie we put up. That that never happened. Yeah. And uh, the hardest part about making a movie is getting, if you have five people in a cast, if you get five people together at the same time, that's almost an impossibility. Uh, but the production costs today are, are almost nothing. When I, when I shot Astron in 1976, the professional film, I spent six grand on that in uh, two days. And then we had to do some reshooting and all this, and it was more on top of that. And like I said, Shadow Slayer was $600, and it's much better moving, better quality, everything, because uh, digital cameras are, are so good today, and, and the editing, uh, editing in 16 millimeter, uh, mm -hmm. is, is uh, arduous. Yeah, and we know this when you actually have splicing tape, and you've cut it with a, uh, Splicer. Flat bed splicer, yeah, big metal. Yeah, it, it, it's heated up, and uh, we use a film cement to glue it, and it, it, yeah. it heats up to, to get a good bond. You have to run it through a, a little screen, and you find out where your edit is, and then you cut it, and then we use this. I used to use the tape on my Super 8 days. Yeah. Then you take the two-sided tape with the sprocket holes in it. Then you'd have to like, put, well, my eyes were better then, but yeah, then yes. you put it down on there on one side, and then you flip it to the other, and then you hope it goes through the projector. Properly, because a lot of times it would get yeah, stuck in the projector. Yeah, it would jump, it would jump in there. Yeah, and yeah. the eight millimeter frame is smaller than your pinky finger number is. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's about that right there. So some of these old movies I made in 8 millimeter, I'm having uh, uh, digital HD prints made. And they're coming up you know, pretty good for as, as cool. tiny as those things are. So those old movies that I made were silent, of course, and uh, I'm trying to put soundtracks on them. Finally finished them. I started them in 1960, and I'm trying to finish uh, them in 2018. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still got mine somewhere, and then I think last time I checked them, I still popped open the Super 8 tape, the case. It's like a little, little round disc, and you pop it out, and you can pull the film on, and you can look at it. Because I always heard that sooner or later it's going to start deteriorating. Yeah, it does. Mine never is. Mine, yeah, mine's yeah. still, I could pull it out of the reel, I don't know how long ago it was, but yeah. pull it out and I can hold it up to the light and look at it, I could put it in a projector, run it through the projector and still see my movie. And yeah. Silent, same way, I got a silent camera at one point and shot some... some yeah, I just uh, sent off a 400 foot movie that I made with my wife uh, in 1969. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was in Super 8 and uh, it came out pretty good. The quality of the yeah. transfer. And that cost... 100, 120 bucks for the transfer, so that's wow. Fun. Yeah, and I put them on the with the new movies as the little extras, you know, because they, they don't run very well. I did that with Lost Faith. I put it on my super. And, and my stuff. my story with the the gasoline and trying to burn things. I you burned I, I was doing a dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> I was doing a dinosaur thing in my garage, and I stupidly I I had a a plat a glass milk bottle that I had the gasoline in, and another See? identical glass milk bottle that had the water in to put out the fire. Oh, and yeah. when it got out of control, I doused it with the water, but I doused it with the gas. Oh, oh man. Set my whole garage on fire. Uh, <coughs> he outdid me. Next door neighbor, yeah. my hand. And then my next door neighbor saw this and called, called the fire department. The truck came out and put it up. It ruined the uh, air conditioning system. <laughs> How old are you then? Oh, I was uh, 15 or 16. What did Dad do? <laughs> he was good. He had the paint for all of What? Yeah, I know. Uh, they, Can't you be just like the other kids and do drugs and prostitution, you well, idiot? They didn't have drugs and prostitution back when I was young. Was <laughs> <laughs> but my, my dad, you know, he wanted me to play basketball, and I'm just a not a jock in any way, shape, or form. So it, it, he did. He did support me to some degree, but he never understood me. Okay, and uh, I got my artistic ability from my mother's side of the family, not my father's side. He was a great guy and uh, very gregarious. You'd have loved him. Um, he was with Patton in World War II. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he was one of his, he got the, he was presented the court gear by Charles de Gaulle. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Betty would never talk about what he did. Anyways, uh, he would rather I be a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> so, and when I was young, I was a freak because I like comic books and horror movies, right? And now, boy, comic books and the movies about them rule the world. Yeah. Yeah. You got anything you want to throw in on this? I mean, I'm just enjoying listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, pipe up when you want to. So we'll, Joel and I will go on forever. Yeah, we could too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> we bore everybody. What else do we should we talk about? Uh, famous people you work with. I know John Agar. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was in a movie with John That's Agar. Cool. Um, yeah, it was cool. Um, uh, he was one of my ideals because um, he made Tarantula and the Mole People. And yeah, not Fort Apache. <laughs> oh, I hadn't seen Fort Apache at that time. Um, and he uh, was in uh, Brain from Planet Aros and uh, Hand of Death. That was, uh, we know, um, what's her name? Joyce Meadows. Yeah, Joyce Meadows. She's, she's we, wonderful. We, yeah. we had her come to the Tampa Theater and we showed the brain from Planet Eros. So we okay. talked all about that and everything. <laughs> yeah. When I met her, she didn't look any different than she did when she made the movie. She really was well preserved lady. How did that come about? Sir? Okay, the John Acar thing was uh, in um, in Winter Park, uh, where I grew up and went to Winter Park High School. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a famous movie producer by the name of R. John Hugh. Not to be confused with John Hughes, the, the famous. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The guy who really makes movies. Uh, but our John Hugh, he'd come out of the woodwork about every 10 years and get the money together to make a movie. And he made a, a, a pot boiler. Uh, it was called uh, A Crowd for Lizette. Boy, that's a title that would stampede you to the box office. Uh, it was later retitled Lizette, and it was ultimately re released as uh, Fall Girl, which, okay, that, that title works. Uh, it was about a young Oriental young lady who fell into uh, the dark side a little bit. There was a kind of family drama. 
and John Agar was a star. And uh, Greta Chai, uh, she was uh, the Oriental gal in Fathom with Raquel Welsh. And oh, okay. Other yeah. than that, oh, and cool. that, I don't know what else she did, but this was probably her first movie. And you know, I'm a fanatic about movies, and I was just crazy to watch it. So I stayed. They, they filmed scenes in Winter Park High School, and I was an extra. That's how I got to be in the movie with uh, John Agar. But I would hang around there after school was out and watch the film things. And they, they were shooting Greta. Uh, on the, the sidewalk in front of the playing field and she did this for 35 takes and I'm not exaggerating and blew every one of them and it was so much that it bored me and I went home I mean, <laughs> it was so dull and you know, tedious to, to do that there was a thrill to see Agar he, he was smiling and effervescent and very um, uh, he had a great personality but he wasn't the guy I was used to seeing in Tarantula. But when they turned the camera on, he got right into it. Yeah, said, yeah. Oh, that's my man there. Yeah. yeah. That was cool. Who else did I call? I was in a Superboy episode. <laughs> oh, cool. The <laughs> ones at Universal? Or? Yeah, the ones with... Uh, oh, Dean Cain? No, no, no. no, no, no. Uh, way back? I don't even remember his name. Um, uh, oh, not Dean Cain. The guy before that, Christopher... No, no, There's no. three. Are you talking back in the '60s? No, the TV series. This was in like Universal Studios, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's. Um, there's three. There's, there's three yeah, Superboys. Yeah. And I and I forget their names. They ran four seasons. I can't yeah. remember the names either. Yeah. But in the first season, they did one where uh, they shot it at the training field, the baseball training field. They had Clark Kent as a pitcher. And as they panned the audience, I was one of the guys in the bleacher. Oh, okay. My daughter and her girlfriend were sitting in front of us, and they got a full view, but you can see me from here down. <laughs> <laughs> and over the years, like I, I, I met Joyce Meadows, uh, we had a wonderful thing going. Uh, I was a part of it for a couple of years, uh, the Asheville Film Festival. It was a continuation of the Western Film Fest Festivals that they had in the 50s, but by the 90s, all the Western stars were pretty much dead. So they went bringing other people, like I was talking to yes, yesterday about Lana Wood, she was there, and somebody had been friends with her uh, here at the show. Uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, James Whitmore, oh, wow. uh, Gary, uh, wow. Gary Lockwood from uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey. I uh, got to be with him quite a bit. Tell the story about him. I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. And um, he went to high school with uh, Marlon Mason, who was the female lead on the James Franciscus series. Uh, the guy in the wheel, the blind detective. Oh, Long Street. Long Street. Yeah, yeah, right. Bruce Lee. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah Bruce Lee didn't count. Yeah. Well, uh, Bruce, yeah. No, he doesn't count, but he was in it, and so was Mark <laughs> Richmond. Uh, Bruce Lee also was in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, she had a like a five or six, maybe ten year career. She was in a movie with Elvis Presley, and then she retired. And then in 1968, no, excuse me, in 2000, 2004, when she was 68, she started making her own movies, like us. Oh, wow. She wrote the story, and she starred in it, and she had a guy uh, direct it and put it together. It was a ten minute short called, called Model Rules. It was a real uh, somber little sad story about this woman who had to go pose in the nude for art class. And she did these nude scenes at age 68. So, boy, man, wow. she, she's quite a gal. And uh, she does have wrinkles, uh, but uh, to me, she's a, one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. And she inspired me to do something other than comic book movies. And uh, I think Shadow Slayer uh, is closer to what I would want to make. And uh, since then, she's. Uh, made four or five movies, and uh, all of them have won in various uh, film festivals around the country. Wow. Yeah, and, and she's 78 now. Wow, wow. And still going, still making movies. Wow. Yeah. She's making horror movies. Oh, that's me. Did you hear Besetment? Have you heard of that? Besetment. Look it up. It just was released. Uh, and, oh, uh, okay. Weird title. I don't know. And a full feature. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. And she's the monster woman. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> Man, that's great. Well, when we met Joyce, she was like, Holf, you got something for me to do. I'd love to do it. Oh, yeah, I found that to be true. And I wish I had been able to take advantage of it. Ed Nelson, who uh, produced and starred in The Brain Eaters. You know, I met him, and uh, we, we were very close together for the length of the uh, 
couple of conventions, and uh, the, the Asheville Festival wasn't like Megacon. There's like maybe 150 people there, and I was with the people like I'm with you. I wasn't, you know, there weren't armed guards keeping Ed Nelson yeah, away. Yeah, from him. yeah. And so I, he he loved making those old movies for Corman. Attack of the Crab oh, Monsters. Cool. He, the scene over here, you see the Crab Monster. I was a Crab Monster, and you can see my feet sticking out the bottom. And he had all kinds of stories like that. He was a, a great guy. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Everybody I wanted to put in a movie dies before I can oh, put it together. Man. But he would have been a good one. I was going to do a remake or a sequel to that and have him play the same guy who played in the uh, Oh, really? Yeah. You would be wearing your straight jacket in the in yeah. the asylum. <laughs> Ruth Buzzy, uh, you remember oh, her from Laughing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to sing a duet with her, uh, singing oh. Happy Birthday. And the way she sang it was just unbelievable. <laughs> 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 really crazy, crazy lady, really nice. Uh, I met dozens and dozens of people, all the Western stars, uh, Jock Honey, Charles Steer, Tex Ritter, Roy Rogers. Wow. I got the Roy wow. Rogers uh, contract license to do the Roy Rogers comic books. We made a lot of products for Roy Rogers uh, that he wow. sold through uh, the Roy Rogers Museum in Victorville. Yeah, uh, I, uh, his son was his business manager at that time, and they had a, a regular agent, and the agent also handled Lash LaRue, and uh, I did Sunset Carson. Uh, all these guys came in through the same agent. Um, I did Bob Steele, <coughs> uh, Tim Holt. Uh, I'm blanking. I did Buck Jones? Of, no, I, 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 I reprinted one Buck Jones story, oh, Monty Hale. Uh, I became good friends with Monty Hale. Uh, he was a star of Republic in the mid to late 40s. He was out by 1950, but he made 19 movies. And he was the first one in Republic to do a color western. Uh, and I met him at the first western show I went to in 73, and then uh, I was part of a Western convention that we had in Orlando in 76, and we had Monty in and Dick Ferran, Rod Cameron, Chill Wills, a lot of big name guys. I just made an audio recording of that, and we've been buddies ever since. And um, he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but that was a great experience for me. He called me up on the phone, you know, every month or so. And, he was just thrown in every time and put one of his old comic stories in one of my books. Mm -hmm. uh, great guy. He married a really uh, wonderful girl. Uh, and both of them worked with Gene Autry and Gene's wife, uh, Joanne, at the Autry Museum of Western wow. Heritage. Cool. Uh, and they, all of them, except for uh, Mrs. Autry, are deceased now. But Monty and Joanne were very much a part of that. And that's one of the most prestigious uh, museums that we got. We went through there when we were out in California. It, it isn't, a, 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 there's a room about movie cowboys, most of it's the real West, like they had the actual jail cell the Billy the Kid was incarcerated oh, wow. in, but they had the Durango Kid's actual movie costume with the mask and hat and everything. He was oh, my cool. hero and I got to see that. And also I got up with Jock Mahoney who doubled uh, uh, Charles Sterrett who was the Durango Kid and he was Range Rider on TV and, and uh, uh, Yancey Derringer. And he was the 13th Tarzan. He did Tarzan Goes to India oh, and cool. Tarzan's Three Challenges. And after I, Johnny Marshall? Oh yeah. After, oh no, no. After one. Yeah, yeah, after it was in cool. the 60s. And then Ron Eli came after them. Yeah. Well, he was a TV guy. There was uh, cool. Mike Henry was in between Jocko and uh, Ely. And uh, uh, Jocko did a couple of guest shots on the Ron Ely TV show. He and oh really? Were buddies, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And when we had. Uh, Jocko at the Orlando Con, I had him demonstrate, you know, throwing punches and stuff, and I used Mr. Zabla there as the punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day. And the other celebrity that I was very close to was Irish McCullough, who was uh, Sheena in the in the 50s, the first oh, yeah, TV okay. Sheena. Yeah. Boy, that was fabulous. Uh, she was a great guy. She called all the time, too. And she'd tell me all those wonderful stories uh, that uh, I wish we, we I, I went together with Bill Ferret, who really is knowledgeable on uh, jungle-themed movies. He wrote a book called uh, uh, Lure of the Tropics, T-R-O-P-I-X. And it was through him I got up with Irish. And uh, we wrote this book on her, and then we premiered it at one of the Tampa comic shows. And she came down for that, so I got to meet her and be with her and all that. Is that the one with the Doubletree? Uh, no, this is before that. Or Men Right Building? 
uh, I don't know, it was uh, Doris and Dawn, I can't remember the last name, it was the Sun Con, as you learned. Oh, oh, Doris's yeah. show, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. She and Doris had a couple at the mentoring. Yeah. That's where I met Conrad Brooks, but yeah. if it wasn't yeah. at the mentoring, yeah. Conrad that's Brooks. Doris. Yeah. Our Real short lady. Yes, very short. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. She ran her own show yeah. with her husband. Yeah, cool. So, uh, Irish, uh, she's five foot ten and a quarter and 39 and a half, 22, 36. Very statuesque, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful women that ever lived. Uh, she was a cover model and was on hundreds of magazine covers. Fabulous face and the cameras just loved her. And uh, Paul Power, another artist, and he's a storyboard artist, he, he worked on uh, some Schwarzenegger movies and a lot of big movies. He was there too and with Chick Stone, a Marvel artist. The four of us were guests at, at Doris's show that year and uh, of course uh, Paul and I uh, were just drooling over Irish. Paul's about this tall. <laughs> and uh, we're walking down the corridor and Iris is in front of us and I said, boy, look at her. You know, we always talk about her upper attributes, but I said, look at her waist. I mean, for her age, I mean, my God, look, she has a real slender waist. He said, he was uh, from Australia. Yeah, Mike, you know, she really does. Hey, Iris, you know, I'm always meant to compliment you on the smallness of your waist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she says, Paul, and she grabs and hugs him. And now he's this tall and she's this tall and his face went right where... Yeah, he planned that. He planned that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I... Sorry, you son of a bitch. <laughs> but the time's really flying by. We're almost done, but you might want to ask if there's any uh, questions, questions from the from audience. audience. From the peanut gallery. No? No? Baby got bored and left and another lady did too. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say anything more? No. No? no? <laughs> Nothing? What? Okay. I know you want to say something. Say yeah. something. Maybe you want to say something? Something? Go ahead, something, baby. Something. 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 <laughs> okay, I'll tell you one of Iris' stories that she told that also involved Jock Mahoney. I, I found a magazine, uh, one of those movie magazines from the 50s, uh, where they would have photographs of the stars in their leisure hours, right? And they had a spread on the time that Jock Mahoney asked Irish McCullough out on a date. So I asked her about this one time when she called up. And she said, yeah, uh, it was really neat. Uh, he's real tall, 6'3", so he was a perfect match for her. I mean, they were, would be an ideal couple. Uh, so he calls on her and he, he arrives in a uh, Cadillac convertible with the uh, steer horns on the front, you know, for, yeah, like a, a Western movie star would have. Uh, he may have, he did a movie where he played a Western movie star and this might have been uh, part of that and he borrowed the car. Anyways, they had a nice date and everything and uh, everything went fine at the restaurant and they went back and uh, she lived in the, on a second story apartment and there was a little balcony, stairs going up to her front door and uh, he uh, bashfully uh, went in for a, a good night kiss and uh, she kissed him and he acted like, oh, 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 and he fell over the balcony <laughs> oh, oh my God. And she screams, oh my God. And you know, he was acting like he was swooning because he kissed Iris. Yeah, oh. yeah. And she runs over to the balcony and looks over, and he's sitting in his Cadillac going, <laughs> <laughs> he was a world class stunt man. Yes. He had this all planned out. Yes. And, uh, oh, wow. and that a great story, and it's not in the book because I didn't know it at the time. Wow. Yeah, he was a great guy. You know, he, uh, he doubled for the Drango kid, and uh, um, he would always be the guy in the costume that would jump off the roof onto the horse. Yeah. And I said, John, how would you do that? I mean, didn't that like ruin you for life when you yeah. sounded like that? And he said, no, what you do is, is you come down with your legs like this, and he had real strong leg muscles, and he, he hugged that saddle so that it eased himself in in those last few yeah. inches and saved himself. And he said, uh, you know, Durango had four horses. And I said, no, I didn't know he had four horses. His horse was a white stallion named Raider. He said, yeah, there was Raider, but there was three others. And one would be good for posting for pictures. Oh, yeah. One was good for doing the stunts. And one was good for uh, being in the movie and all that. And I forgot what the fourth one was for. But uh, he said, but this one horse had done so many stunts that uh, he was wise to when they were going to do it. And he did pretty much like the idea of a six foot three guy <laughs> jumping off jumping the roof on, onto yeah. his back. So they had this scene coming up and uh, the horse was walking and winning and was not cooperating, would not stay in the alleyway where it was supposed to be. 
So uh, Jock Mahoney went to the uh, uh, director and the, uh, the cameraman and said, listen, I got to wait. I, I think we can do this. He said, break for lunch. Send everybody away. You just stay on the camera and I'll get up on the roof and the horse will settle down and it worked. The horse just said, <laughs> and then <laughs> wham, <laughs> man. <laughs> Those are the days. That was good. We, uh, I knew a, a, an author, David Rothel, who lives in Sarasota, and he taught at a school there, uh, film classes. And he had Jock Mahoney out from California. And he knew I was a fan of Jock's, and that, uh, that's, this is how I met him. And I had several of his films, uh, Tarzan's Three Challenges and some Range Riders and uh, Nancy Derringer films. So I went down to Sarasota and met him, and then I, I got to take him to his hotel room he autographed it, not an 8 by 10 but a 11 by 14 still wow, from cool. Range Rider, yeah, and uh, we chatted it up quite a bit, and he would call me occasionally too. Then we had him at the Orlando Con uh, with Gil Kane, the same show, yeah. boy, that was a winner. Are well, we out of time now? We are. We are. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you. Yay.